Hey, what's up, everybody? I'm Matt Bell. I'm the host of Limitless. I've got a good one for you today that's going to expand your understanding of geology and the cataclysmic history of North America. If you ask around, almost no one has heard of a group of over 70,000 elliptical-shaped ground depressions scattered across North America known as the Carolina Bays. We find these elliptical depressions all up and down the East Coast, but we also find them in the Midwest in places like Nebraska. And no matter where you find them, they're always pointed to towards Michigan. Few people have heard of them, but even fewer people realize that these could have been created by a massive meteor that struck the Laurentide ice sheet on top of Michigan and sent ice, water, sand, and rock debris flying across North America thousands of years ago. The same meteor impact could have created the Michigan Basin and made the formation of the Great Lakes possible at the end of the Pleistocene when the ice sheet melted. But when did this impact occur? We're going to dive deep into that, but whenever it happened, it was cataclysmic. Chris Cottrell is one of the world's top experts on the Carolina Bays. He's an educator of geology. He was a presenter at the Cosmic Summit in 2023, and he will be again in 2024. On Limitless, we're always going to explore alternative theories and possibilities. This one seems like much more than a possibility. It seems much stronger than that. But let me know what you guys think in the comments. Thanks, everybody. I really hope you enjoy this episode of Limitless. All right. Awesome. So, Chris, how's hey, it going, man? Very, very well. Thank Good. you. I appreciate the invite to come and talk about Carolina Bays because there's a lot of people that need to know about them. No doubt. No <laughs> doubt. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of those huge mysteries that uh, is just kind of under the radar. I, I, I've been around, you know, ever since I started listening to you and, and hearing some of the theories about the Carolina Bays, I've asked, you know, probably a dozen people mm -hmm. as, as they're talking about, you know, I'm talking about my podcast. Who are you going to be talking to? What are you going to be talking about? Nobody has heard of the Carolina Bays. Yeah. You mentioned Carolina Bays and and it's, it's clueless. Yeah. 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 And people, it's, people live in the middle of these Carolina Bays and have no idea. <laughs> and, and there's such dominant features on, yeah. on the coast of, of, uh, of the coast of the United States. And, and we find them all the way in the central part of the United States. And yep. It's just such a, uh, yeah, such a dominant feature that is just completely ignored. It's crazy. Yeah. And they go by different names uh, across mm -hmm. the country in different spots. And, and again, nobody's ever heard of them, but it's like, if we take a look at these things and actually try to think about, you know, what, what could have caused these and when could have it, uh, when could it have happened, mm -hmm. then we could potentially learn a lot about our history, the history of the planet. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I agree. Yeah. yeah. Well, tell us what's your background, Chris. Well, um, I'm, I'm a secondary science teacher. Um, I teach in coastal Georgia. Um, I've been doing that for 23 years now, 22, 23 years. Cool. Um, you know, I, I have a degree in secondary science education. Uh, while I was going through school, I, I picked up two minors in geology and environmental geography. Um, through that process, I also have a, a mass. I have two master's degrees. I have a master's in education. I have another master's in um, geoscience from Mississippi State University. And and um, so I, I, f I don't usually start with that, you know, most of the time. But it's kind of an important part of the of the discussion because. You know, I, I often get, you know, hey, we got some guy on YouTube here, you know, making videos in his mom's basement. And that's that's not <laughs> what's happening here. You know, I, I am, like I said, a, a science teacher and, and the scientific process is really important to me. And when it comes to the Carolina Bays, I don't see our academic scientists following the, the procedures, the, the scientific process. And that's really, that really bothers me. Yeah, 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 <laughs> so, yeah. And so it's kind of become a passion for you over the last couple uh, of decades. Passion, obsession, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, maybe an addiction. I, yeah. I need to cut that one off sometime. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, but you, I'm sure you, when you got into it, you're probably thinking, all right, well, I'll, this is pretty easy to solve. I'm going to get, I'll be in, out in a couple of months, you know, I'll just explain this to uh, to people and, and it'll be accepted and we'll move on to what's next. Exactly. You know, I, I, to me, this is like low-hanging fruit. Yeah. Like I see this, I, 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 you know, understand the processes that are involved here and it, there's just no way that you know what the current academic uh, science is using as their their current hypothesis holds holds much weight. Right. And um, so yeah, I figured you know I'd start popping some videos and uh, you know and one hundred percent my my uh, audience you know my my um, you know the people that I were that I was trying to you know get this message out to was not the average YouTube person, you know, it was the academic scientists. It was the yeah. people that are in that field yeah. and trying to point out the discrepancies and, and, you know, just the flaws in that scientific process that are, that are lacking. And that was back in 2015. I started that. I, like I said, I got that, that master's in, um, in, um, geoscience. And I was like, all right, I got everything I need now. Let's, let's roll on. Yep. And, uh, here we are. And I mean, it's 2023, I'm about to be 2024. And, yeah. and I'm, it's the fight's still happening. It's still happening. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You've pushed it forward though. I hope so. Yeah. I hope so. Well, I'm here yeah. talking with you. So right. that's, that's the thing. Right. Right. Yeah, <laughs> so, exactly. Yeah. You were at the yeah. cosmic summit last year. You presented yes. there. So. Yeah. Yeah. The cosmic summit was fantastic. Yeah. You know, it was kind of, uh, you know, a, a proof of concept, 
um, uh, George Howard uh, put this all together. Um, well, I'll mention him a few times because uh, he's he's so critical to a lot of the uh, the um, discussion in, in in all of these mysteries that we're discussing right now. Um, and he he went through the process of getting all the people that he feels that can can add and contribute to that uh, conversation all together in one building, and uh, it was just it was phenomenal. It yep. was great. Yeah. It was great. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Well, the goal for this podcast is let's get the narrative changed. Let's do it. Let's be so convincing that it's it's beyond <laughs> okay. overwhelming that that these yeah. things could not have been made by wind. You know, puddles yeah. puddles of water on the ground being pushed around by wind. That there's yeah. that there's uh, that there's more to this story. Okay. So so what are Carolina bays? Um, they are you know these elliptical shaped depressions. They're not they're not round. They're not circular. They they are um, an elliptical. Uh, they have elliptical geometry. Um, we have a couple people in the field right now that are. Uh, measuring these, they're using different uh, techniques and methods to uh, to prove that these are like actual geometrical uh, geometric um, uh, ellipses. Uh, they all have raised rims, which is uh, pretty unique. Um, and so, so they're they're um, they're 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 indented into the ground, but they also have raised rims. Yeah, they have okay. raised rims around them. Okay. Uh, yeah, and they're pushed in. Okay. Um, and you can see in, in just some of those images there. Uh, now the picture on the top, I have the 1930 aerial survey. Now these were the first images that came out of Carolina Bays, and and you know you can. I could see why somebody would see that and and kind of you know assume that they were more like dune features, like sand dunes, um, those black and white pictures like that. Those are, are pretty much untouched uh, today. You can still fly over yeah. uh, this part. This is actually in Myrtle Beach. Yeah. Uh, we'll look at we'll focus on this a little more in, in a little bit. Um, I mentioned already that the uh, the name Carolina Bay comes from the bay trees that grow inside of them. Um, you know, bay tree bay leaves. A lot of people you will use them for like spaghetti or like mm -hmm. flavoring like mm -hmm. crab oil or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where they grow really well in there. There's also some really neat uh, vegetation that grows in there, like uh, uh, the pitcher plants and the the Venus flytraps and things like that. They grow in, in the uh, Carolina Bays really well. Uh, but another uh, really interesting common feature that they all have is that they have a radial alignment, and um, they're all pointed kind of to the same location on the map. And I think that's a really important. Um, you know, a really important feature that these Carolina Bays have. It's like the most important feature. I think so. I yeah. think so. Yeah. yeah. They're all different sizes. You know, you have all sure. these different sizes, uh, but they all have the same shape. They all have the same radial alignment. Uh, and they all, like I said, they all, that radial alignment all points to the Great Lakes, uh, which is, which is really important. Um, now they're all within a size range, right? I mean, you don't see them that they, they don't exceed, I'm sure like a certain maximum. So there's gotta be a biggest one, but uh, yeah. And I'm not sure exactly which one that is. I okay. know a lot of people will point to uh, Lake Waccamaw okay. uh, as being the largest Carolina Bay. Uh, but if you look at Lake Waccamaw using the LIDAR, um, it's, it's not really a good example. It's not really, um, it's probably actually three Carolina Bays okay. Okay. together, um, which is, uh, pretty interesting. Okay. Um, so I'm not exactly sure. I'd have to go back and look and see which one is the actual biggest one that we have. But yeah. there's, some, I mean, these, some of these are huge. Some of these are like miles. Right. You know, they're they're really large. Uh, and then you have some that are smaller. Um, I had the opportunity to dig into one of the smaller ones uh, a few years back with. Uh, well, we'll see some pictures of that, but it was actually with uh, George Howard and some of the other guys we'll discuss today. So. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I don't want to jump ahead of myself, but I do want to eventually ask the question as to why they're basically in the same direction, but there's slight variance to the direction that they're facing. And that could be, um, that could be error of marking them. Um, it could also be, I think that it could be, you know, depending on how these were created, yeah. uh, slight variations in, you know, the shape of the object, the shape of the object, the, the ground, I would think. right. Or, or the, uh, the, um, uh, you know, just one slight notch, you know, or a bump yeah. can cause a difference yeah. like that. So, yeah. um, but overall they, they all have a very similar yeah. orientation, right? Um, and you know, if you, if they all cross, they're all going to cross over one location. So, right, right, right. Um, so far, if you, if you read Wikipedia, uh, and, and we can talk about Wikipedia a little bit later. Um, you know, I, first of all, if you read Wikipedia, you're, uh, you're going to get the main stream, you know, academic hypothesis for how Carolina base form. Uh, to me, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And there's a whole, there's a whole issue. There's a battle with Wikipedia right now. And, uh, uh again, it's, it's pretty irritating. Talk but, about disinformation. I mean, yeah. you know, and just control of a narrative. Exactly. That's Wikipedia. Yeah. Yeah. And, and a lot of people take Wikipedia, they confuse it with an encyclopedia, right. you know, a book of facts or a location of facts. Right. Um, but it is manipulated by people, you right. know, it's people that are trying to push their narratives. And, right. and, uh, and of course you bring that up and it's like, Oh, whatever, yeah. you know, it's like, yeah. but, you can actually go into any Wikipedia page, and I believe it's a, a talk icon. 
um, or a discussion icon that's on the top. And you can go back and you can read through all the changes that have been made, all the uh, discussions that people have had on why they want to remove something or why they want to add something. Uh, and you can follow the whole story. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you can mm-hmm. follow the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and again, it, it boils down to who's who's got the most time on their hands. Right. Because you know, eventually at some point, most people are like, okay, I'm just done with it. I, right. I can't keep doing that. Right. So, or who's donating the most, most, most to Wikipedia, right? Yep, Usually yep, yep. In, so, yeah, institutions. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's really uh, become quite a problem. But yeah. Um, anyway, so Wikipedia says that there's like a half a million of these Carolina Bays, okay. which would actually help, you know, the alternative hypotheses if there were half a million. But that's not that's not true. Um, as of right now, um, there have been 70,000 plus uh, Carolina Bays that have been marked and labeled and, and you know, uh, fit with a pattern, a, a geometric ellipse. Um, 70,000 is a lot, mm-hmm. you know, uh, mm-hmm. and this kind of ends up becoming a story of, of you know, how many coincidences does it take before you reevaluate your your current hypothesis? Mm-hmm. You know, I, I've mentioned in the past, you know, if you come across two identical geometric shapes in nature, that's amazing. It's right. like, wow, out of that form, you right, know, right, right. you know, two two snowflakes side by side that are identical. It'd be like, wow, that's really cool. Yeah. You find five or six of them. That's like, OK, now we're you know, are we still in, in coincidence mode? Uh, 70,000 plus of them, you know, at what point are you like, how can they be this? precise how could they have the same exact elliptical shape right. over and over and over again side by side and like i said they all have that as you go from the north and work your way to the south that radial alignment you know maintains itself pointed mm-hmm. right right to the great lakes right mm-hmm. up there mm-hmm. uh and and so um again i think these are all all telling signs that that we're not just looking at probability we're not just looking at uh you know a coincidence of of how these carolina bays formed um there and, and you know, Carolina Bays is just kind of a, a common term that we use because most of these are actually really visible in North and South Carolina. Um, we do find uh, elliptical shaped basins in Maryland. They call them the Maryland basins there. Um, the Del Marble Peninsula has some. Uh, again, if you compare them side by side, you could tell immediately that they're that they're the same thing. You know, mm-hmm. they're, they're the same, um, you know, shapes, same, same alignment. Um, they do have uh, occasionally they do have slight changes in shape based on location. And it could it has more to do with elevation changes, mm-hmm. uh, which we'll look at a couple examples of those here in a few minutes. Uh, Pocosins is my favorite um, term. I, I, I kind of thought about just start calling them all Pocosins. I okay. just think it's a neat term. It's actually a Native American term. It means uh, a swamp on a hill. Okay. Um, and and uh, it's just a cool name. Yeah. Pocosin. Yeah. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit more about this in a little bit. But uh, if we go halfway across the continent into places like Nebraska and Kansas, um, they have near identical elliptical shapes with identical orientation pointed to the same location on the map um, that are known as the uh, Nebraska rainwater basins and the Kansas rainwater basins. And we keep finding more and more of them. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there was some recently found in Louisiana. And, and you know, again, what are the coincidences? You know, how many of these do we have to keep stacking on top of each other right. uh, before we start questioning, you know, how, how do these things form? Right. And um, they're basically in a ring then? I mean, is it like, is the bottom part of that, uh, uh, is that is that a ring shape, would you say? Or in, it, it gets, I guess it kind of gets lost a little bit when you get close to what, the, the Mississippi? like. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, there's definitely, a, it's about a 1,500 uh, kilometer distance from where they all meet, which we'll, like I said, we'll discuss that, but um, about 1,500 uh, my, a kilometer, um, uh, I guess you can call it a ring, um, all the way around there. And, and yes, you're right. There are some missing within that, like, uh, that, that central portion of Mississippi and, and, uh, and moving all the way up. But, um, there are other features in there that I'm not quite ready to get into yet. Um, there's some really interesting pock, pockmark features, um, that could be related to Carolina Bays, uh, from the same event or whatever that may have formed them. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're just different. They don't have these same, like I said, right now we're just talking about these, the these features that have elliptical shapes, raised rims and radial alignment. Mm-hmm. Um, and like I said, these are all examples of those. Uh, but like I said, there are other, other, uh, things out there that could be part of the same thing. Other so, geological anomalies, yeah. but they're not elliptical in shape. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. More, more. We got to speculate a little bit on uh, that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> But so, so, so the red marks then are where we've for sure found them. And then the, the yellow lines. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. And, um, if you go to the next slide, Ryan. So, so this is an example of, uh, you know, a Google earth image. Uh, you, anybody that has a computer now can pull up Google earth. Uh, and we can see that, um, you know, you can see roads, you can see farms, you can see, uh, you know, where people live, there's whole towns in there, Barton right there, South Carolina. You can see where the uh, Mississippi, uh, no, I'm sorry, not the Mississippi river, but the uh, Savannah river. Uh, there on the left, um, you know, this is this is what we would all see if you pull up uh, Google Earth. Oh, sure, nothing yeah. to see here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and right, and so, and this is the this is the what you see when you pull up lidar. Um, 
And and yeah, you can see from this image right here the the orientation of all of these. And this is actually not even a great example of Carolina bass because if you look at them, they're kind of a little more guitar guitar, guitar pick. Guitar yeah, pick that's shape. what I was thinking. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, and that has to do if 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 you are able to understand or follow the uh, the pattern with the lidar. It's, it's colorized. Uh, we'll talk about Michael Davies in just a second, but uh, he's the man responsible for putting this lidar out online. It's, it's free to everyone. Okay. Uh, and and if you look at the scale on the left side, um, it starts with blue and then goes up through a color. Like every every ten meters, it changes and shifts color until you get back to blue on the top. And so so it repeats itself every ten meters as you go up. Uh, so so the darkest blue is sea level. And as you go up, it changes colors to, you know, that red color and then back to a blue color. And that's, that's every 10 meters. Mm -hmm. uh, and even in this image, you can see that there's a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, uh, undulation or terrain change uh, as you move towards the, the south part of this image. Uh, and that's probably why these Carolina bass have more of a guitar pick shape, uh, because whatever formed them probably uh, shifted down just a little bit. But we'll look at some more examples here in just a minute. This, <laughs> these are the ones I started with, and they're actually not the best examples, but... Uh, but so, you could, uh, so, the, so the lowest elevation and the highest elevation both blue just to make sure that we're uh, that we're like well it's repeating attention. it's repeating yeah 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 <laughs> uh, no but it is it's important that we know that's repeating because that every time you see red it's ten meters every time you see blue it's ten I meters you know? so okay. he just started with uh, with blue on the bottom matter okay. of fact if you click the next uh, slide this is Michael Davius uh, he's the man responsible for putting all of this together mm -hmm. um, he has been I mean putting in uh, a tireless amount of energy in, into into his uh used to be called the carolina bay survey now it's the ovoid uh, basin survey mm -hmm. um he just wanted to make sure that he included all of these different uh names that we have for the carolina bays into one so he's got to push for ovoid basins um i think that uh, elliptical is a better name but uh that's what he went with and he's okay. he's the guy who's been doing this so i'm not gonna yeah. argue with him he's the reason we're talking <laughs> exactly yeah. exactly yeah. and and I've, I've i've told him before you know i kind of feel like i'm riding on his coattails sometimes because he he's definitely put in so much energy into this um and, and this is what he's decided to do as as you know he, he moves into retirement uh he's huge into uh fast cars and carolina bays and cool. that's what he does cool right. <laughs> so um uh, so yeah, he's literally gone in and, and put a, a, a finger on each one of those red dots. Okay. Uh, and they all are, um, orient oriented as well. The, the lines actually show the orientation. So, oh, yeah, so the, right. the question that you originally had was, uh, you know, where do those lines come from? And this is where they come from. Okay. Um, you know, he's gone in and marked each one of these by hand. This is where we get that 70,000 number from. That's how many he's actually gone in, clicked on, um, labeled, put into a survey okay. and, uh, and has that orientation lined up to them. Um, and we'll talk more about Michael as we get into this because uh, he's, he's got more to do with the story. So, okay. um, and I guess if you've got them, if there was some event and you've got them kind of piling, it, it, you, you could have, if there's 70,000 that we see, they're very easily could be double that just because one's landing on top of the other and creating a bigger mm -hmm. impression. You know? Right. Yeah. And, and some of these areas, like it's so jumbled together, yeah. like it could just be, you know, uh, a hundred of them fell down right then. And yeah. it's just, you just, we'll, we'll talk more about it. I don't want to okay. get ahead of ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah fair enough. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so yeah, back in the 1930s, this was when, uh, you know, we first really kind of got a good eye on these Carolina bays. Uh, and again, they were, they were doing surveys for agriculture and, and they saw this, uh, they actually posted in, uh, the Harper's Ferry, uh, that image that we saw earlier. And that spurred on a, a tremendous amount of, of intrigue. Uh, and again, meteors were the first like big hypothesis that came out. Uh, and you know, uh, there's a lot of scientists out there that, uh, have a hard time going against a uniformitarianism hypothesis for anything. Uh, and we can get into why that is, but, uh, you know, I I anything that could be catastrophic mm -hmm. automatically gets scoffed at, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. that, that, uh, you know, a, a, a sneer and it's like, uh, you know, right. we're going to find some other reason that, that that's right. not possible. That's why the younger dress isn't even. It, exactly. Yeah. That's, that's why that's become yeah. a big, a big yep. talking point. Yep. And um, why is that? I mean, what's what's the issue with admitting that there's been catastrophes in the past? Well, I think it goes I think it goes back a hundred hundreds of years. Yeah. Um and, and a lot of it's biblical. I think a lot of it has to do with religion and science and okay. the back and the forth. And you know, there was a time where uh, you know, science was trying to get ahead of a religion and so anything that was mentioned in the Bible was was pushed to the side. Mm. Like that there's no way that there could be catastrophic floods. There's no way that there could be, you know, brimstone and fire falling from the sky. You know, there's no way that we can have these things. So if it's brought up, just Mm -hmm. We're not talking about it. Mm -hmm. We're going we're gonna to mm -hmm. move on. We're going to come up with a uniformitarianism solution that, you know, things on earth change one gust of wind, one drop of water, one grain of sand at a time. Right. Uh, and, and like that's like even today, it's, it's a geologic law of uniformitarianism. And out of all of the laws of geology, 
like I think that one needs to be focused on again. Like mm -hmm. I don't, a law means that it's like set in stone. Mm -hmm. And mm, yeah. I, I think that's part of what we're doing today is, is drawing attention to, uh, you know, sometimes things can happen right. that, that jolt the earth and, right. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, you know, the evidence is there, it's written in the landscapes and we just have to understand how to read it better. And yep. that's, that's what we're trying to do now. Yep. Um, so anyways, back, uh, back to the Carolina Bays, you know, they, uh, a, a meteoritic, um, a hypothesis was was quickly eliminated because I couldn't find any like meteors in Carolina Bays, and that's that's fair enough, right? You know, if you don't find meteors, then they weren't created by meteors. Um, there, sh if they were, we should find stuff, and we and they weren't finding anything, and so they moved on to more terrestrial uh, examples. And I have a whole list of them here, um, everything from spring basins. So there were people that hypothesized that you know we had these springs that came up, bubbled up water. I've got an image of one uh, in the top left there. Uh, and then once the water levels drop, you know, you're left behind with this elliptical shape. And, uh, you know, that does happen. But that, again, that would have been, it would have to be every single one of them. All of the Carolina Bays would have had to have been formed that way. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I have already uh, craters for meteor swarms or bolides. That's a, that's a big one. That's still one that's out there right now. Um, uh, one of our friends. Um, uh, um, but but they're but the ones on the western part of the U.S. are heading this facing this way, yeah. and the one on the east are facing yeah. this way. So that kind of knocks that one out. Yeah, well, I think so too. I think yeah. so too. And and what we'll get into like the the mainstream hypothesis and some of the reasons why I don't think that that's going to hold up. Yeah. Kind of holds up. For, it's the same you know reasons why I don't think that uh, bolides can create elliptical shapes over and over and over again. Right. Uh, Randall Carlson is one that that believes that they are from bolides. Uh, and I have to have a discussion with him. We got to uh, have a talk. <laughs> yeah. Maybe he hasn't researched it. Very yeah. Well, well, he, well, he did, but he researched it back in the eighties before we had a lot of this, you know, right. technology and right. stuff. Now right. he's so busy now. I don't think he's gone back to it. Yeah. He's, he's mentioned that before we had a conversation with about it at the cosmic summit. Um, he, uh, we just, I have to, I have to yeah. talk with him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but yeah, that's one, um, obviously, uh, oriented lakes that gets brought up a lot. And that's a big part of the current hypothesis is that they were, um, they're oriented lakes where, where wind and water blow, you know, the, the banks of a river or a uh, stream into a uh, into a uh, ellipse um, because we do find oriented lakes uh, there are some out there um, there are some you know uh, I think they call them playa lakes uh, in uh, Texas they have some other some playa lakes in Australia um, so that gets brought up a lot uh, gyroscopic eddies uh, from when you know because there were times where sea levels were much higher than they are today uh, something we'll discuss uh, probably in the next episode but um, you know, there were times where sea levels were much higher and they think that, uh, you know, gyres in the water or swirling water could have created these Carolina bays. Uh, again, most of these hypotheses were created before we even had, you know, Google earth, you know, we were still using aerial photos and those were really lacking. Um, so I, you know, these were mostly good. My, my favorite one is, uh, fish nests. You know, they think that there were giant fish, fish or mm -hmm. whales flopping around or mm -hmm. something, mm -hmm. uh, creating these. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, you know, most of these have not panned out, you know, uh, which is, you know, that's how science works. You come up with a good idea, yeah. you know, and all of these were a good idea, you know, at the time. And then you go through the process and, and, you know, you get towards the end and most of these, the conclusion has been, yeah, that's not, that's not, that can't be right. Mm -hmm. Um, so here's a couple other examples. Um, this is from a location in South Carolina. Um, I, I use this this one a lot uh, only because I like the name of the town. It's Bamberg, South Carolina. Uh -huh. um, I, I imagine that if this was some type of cosmic event that created these Carolina Bays, that Bamberg would be a very fitting name for a city. Yep. Um, although this was actually named after a uh, Civil War commander, uh, ba uh, Bamberg. Uh, and so, yeah, it's not. <laughs> it was his last name. Gotcha. <laughs> But yeah, as you can see, wow. you click over there to the LIDAR and, um, and yeah, it just automatically you see all of those elliptical shape depressions that you didn't see before. You don't see them at all. Uh, Ryan, if you click back real quick and just make a comparison, you know, you don't see any of those elliptical shapes. But now we have access to that LIDAR and you just see that the whole landscape is completely That's covered crazy. in those ellipti elliptical shapes. They all, you can actually fit uh, using various methods that, that they are um, mathematical ellipses. They all have the same orientation. Uh, and again, if, if I found two of those side by side in you know, in a natural environment, I would be pretty amazed. I'd oh, be like, yeah. wow, that's, that's crazy. Yep. Um, and then you start counting these up and it's just one after another, after another, after another. And, and, um, you know, that's again, in, in my opinion, way too much to be a coincidence, uh, of, of natural processes. Um, so this is the, um, the current academically accepted <laughs> hypothesis. Now this is what's right now in, if you do come across Carolina Bays in a, in a geology book, uh, this is what the explanation is going to be. Uh, most, uh, you know, mainstream academic geologists that you talk to are going to say that this is what caused them, uh, that they were formed by gradual Aeolian and lacustrian processes. Aeolian is air, lacustrian is lake water. Uh, and so for this hypothesis to be true, every single one of those Carolina Bays, every single one of those ellipses that we saw, um, 
would have been a pond of water long enough for wind, glacial winds from our from our from the Laurentide Ice Sheet to blow across across the entire landscape of the United States or, or North America, and redirect the water into swirls and reshape the edges of of the uh, the ponds into these perfect ellipses, and then they stopped. Wow. <laughs> Every single one of them, <laughs> over and over and over again, uh, were created this way by the mainstream academic hypothesis for how Carolina Bays form. Um, some people throw in um, uh, thermocarst lakes where they think that you know the ground during the Ice Age was frozen. Uh, but there's no real evidence for that. Um, Chris Sweezy is one. Uh, again, these are, these are USGS geologists, uh, and that's one of his big hypotheses, is that these were thermos, thermocarst lakes and uh, wind and water uh, wind came coming off the glaciers, uh, blew over ponded water from from thermocarst lakes, which we do find thermos, thermocarst lakes. You know, they're up in Alaska. They're up along the uh, the Arctic Circle. Um, there's no evidence that that you know the terrain of the coastal plain was was permanently frozen at any time during the ice age. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, but that's again right now that is a current hypothesis that has a lot of weight and water to it. <laughs> and when you and when you say it's accepted by by most academics today, are you talking like fifty one percent? Are you talking like ninety nine percent? I wish I knew th- those numbers like <laughs> yeah. that. I wish I, I really we need to get a hold of like a really good like statistician or something. Yeah. To, but it's to, what's taught in schools. It's what's being taught. Yeah. If you way. ask any geologist, uh, you know, this is more than likely what they're going to say. If you if you come across one that has like a, a alternative hypothesis, yeah, like I want to talk to them. That's that's the guy I want to talk to. Yeah. Right. 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 <laughs> because they're not writing papers. Those guys aren't writing papers. You know, these guys are. And, and when, you, when you know, when you have to say Aeolian and Lucustrian, you know that you're trying to like pull a fast one. Yeah. Oh, and this, that's the short version. You know, they, yeah. you get into, I can't remember, I, I can't even say it. Um, but you know, they talk about the, the, the groundwater levels and then, you know, there's all kinds of stuff that goes into, into this. Just this trust me. It's Aeolian and Lucustrian. Just, <laughs> that's and all water. you need to know. Wind yeah. and water. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Over long periods of time, thousands of years. Now, now some of the evidence that they use to support this hypothesis, uh, is, you know, is radiocarbon dating. Um, I think we could probably agree that there's some issues with radiocarbon dating anyways. Um, but it's still a good way to kind of, you know, give you a roundabout, uh, time, time frame of when these things could have happened. And so what they're doing is they're going in and they're finding, you know, maybe a seed or maybe, you know, a, a branch or something and they're radiocarbon dating that material. And they're coming up with like three different stages or three different ages, um, of when these Carolina Bays should have formed. And we'll talk about my arguments with them here in just a minute, but that's, that's one of the reasons why they think that these are you know, gradual processes of wind and water reshaping ponds um, over and over and over again. It's because of the radiocarbon dates that they get. Um, they, their, their carbon dates all go within 13,000 years to like 100,000 years. Um, and uh, that's going to be important to know later on that, you know, right now the current academic hypothesis has dates within, you know, 13,000 years to 100,000 years. Um, well, like I said, later on, we'll talk about how I, I really think that that's they're finding evidence of, of erosional events in the Carolina Bays, not necessarily the formation. And that's, that's what I think is important is understanding when they formed. Um, they also use optic, optically stimulated luminescence dating. Um, that's actually, you can use um, instruments to determine when the last time like a grain of sand or a rock was exposed to sunlight. Um, and, uh, they, you know, they're coming up with the same dates. So they're, they're using the optically stimulated luminescence dating and the carbon dating as a cross-reference for, for, their, for their hypothesis. Uh, and then also they, they come across, um, like pollen grains and things like that within the, within the sediment layers in the, um, in the Carolina Bays themselves. There is stratigraphy in some of these Carolina Bays. Some of them, it's all mashed up. It's kind of weird. The one that we dug in, um, at, uh, Arabia Bay, um, it was just a mess. Like there was just like layers of, of clay and sand. It was just, it was a mess. Um, and I, I don't know if we could really call that stratigraphy, but mm-hmm. uh, regardless, um, that's what they're using right now for their, for their current hypothesis. Um, if you go back real quick, I, w- I do want to point out uh, the picture on the top there. Um, that's Dr. Christopher Moore. Uh, I actually went and helped with him on an archaeological dig in, uh, at White Pond, South Carolina, and uh, back in 2019. Um, and I went, the, the picture up there is uh, with Micah Hanks. I'm sh- are you familiar with Micah? Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. He's, he's, he's big time in the, into the uh, podcast and, and radio world. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that when I met him. So that was a, I think that was a bonus because we've become pretty good friends after that. Yeah. <laughs> I had no pretenses. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, we had, a, we had a great time digging. And, and like I said, Chris Moore is one of the uh, one of the people that you know is is pushing this current academically uh, academically accepted hypothesis, and so I really wanted to meet him uh, because if I'm going to disagree with him, I, I want to understand his character. Mm-hmm. And um, he is actually a great guy. I really respect a lot of his work. Um, I just I just don't agree with him on on the formation of the Carolina Bays, and um, I can see why he's using this. Uh, he's done a lot of work with some much older um, archaeologists and geologists, and uh, Mark Brooks being one, he was actually at that dig. 
Uh, and, and these guys are, are people that have, you know, again, back in the 80s, you know, the, I'm sure this, this was a good hypothesis, but now we have access to so much better technology right. um, that, that it should be reexamined. And so I'm, I'm really hoping that uh, uh, Dr. Moore will kind of, you know, open his eyes a little bit and, and help us out at some point, but we'll see. Okay. Um, just a few more examples. Again, these are some of the ones that you can really see well from, from the sky. Yeah. Uh, and so these were some of the first ones that we saw. Um, the ones that we saw earlier were actually from, uh, from Myrtle Beach, which we'll look at more in just a second. But um, yeah, when you click over to that LIDAR, you know, not only do you see those ones that you can see really well with the, uh, with the LIDAR, but look at all the other ones that pop up now too, like all the ones on the left side of the screen and the right side of the screen. And again, they're all the same shape. But you can also tell that we're higher up in, in, um, in uh, latitude. Uh, because of the orientation. Look at how they're all kind mm -hmm. of slanted a little bit more now. Yeah, I was going to ask if the map is oriented to the mm -hmm. north. So, yeah, so yeah. We're, 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 we're farther north. Now. Yeah, yeah. every example I've shown you has gone from the south and moving our way to the north. Okay. And you'll notice that the orientation all shifts as we go from one one example to the next. Uh, but they're all still pointed to the same same mm -hmm. location. They're mm -hmm. just, um, but yeah, yeah. Now that we have access to this uh, to this LIDAR, you know, again, I think it really just it brings it to a whole nother level and a whole, you know, a whole nother reason for examination. So, re -examination. The, so, so the wind off of the ice sheets, I mean, how do they how does that line up with the orientation of the um, of these Carolina bays? Like like would, 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 does their theory make sense based on how the wind would have come off of the ice sheets? All, all I know is that they, they call it proglacial directional winds uh, moving from, I think, the northwest to the to the to the southeast. Um, I other than that, I don't know how you can know that. I don't know how we can know exactly the direction of the winds. Um, I, if, I mean, I don't know how we can get away with saying that they were like the exact strength of wind, you know, for, you know, this had been thousands of years, Yeah. you know, and, and I just, it just doesn't make sense. This doesn't make sense to me at all. Yeah. Um, so uh, now I will say, you know, you can look at where the lobes of the ice sheets were and get maybe an idea of winds coming because, because proglacial winds, the, 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 the cold air above a glacier uh, is more dense, and so it drops off the side of the glacier, and that's where the pro they just kind of flow away from the ice. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I mean, I guess maybe a little bit that you're going to have them coming in this direction. But again, I, I would argue that there are way, way too many variables that would cause wind to to behave differently mm -hmm. farther away from its source, mm -hmm. and that's that's not included in this in this hypothesis. Okay. So speaking of which, you know, this is. Um, my my problems that I have with this, you know, gradualistic Aeolian and Lacustrian hypothesis, uh, and it really kind of goes back to, you know, that stack of assumptions we referred to earlier. You know, back in 1977, uh, there was a uh, doctoral student, uh, Ray Kowalski. I hope I, say, I always I always say I butcher that name every time, um, but uh, yeah, he was a um, he was a geology um, a grad student working on his doctorate, and um, you know he went out to, to prove that the Carolina Bays were Aeolian and Lacustrian in, uh, in, in a formation. And he set up a, a, uh, an experiment uh, where he took a, a sand table and made a circular depression uh, and filled it full of water. Now, now right from the get-go, um, if, if you have a, a perfect circular depression, and this is where, where you're starting from, right? I mean, that to me is like the definition of what a crater is, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, a, a perfect circular depression. If you look at the moon, for instance, you know, there are circular depressions completely covering the moon. Uh, and, and so to start that way, it's like it's kind of ironic that, you know, this is what they're using to prove that these aren't a, a cosmic event that took that created these that it was wind and water. And you start with a circular depression, you fill it full of water. That's that's unnatural to begin with. Uh, and that was their go point. That was where they started from. Uh, and he took a, a fan to mimic the proglacial winds, uh, and he blew it uh, in one direction for 15 minutes, and then he took it 180 degrees and blew it in the opposite direction for 15 minutes. And I guess that's supposed to um, to mimic the proglacial winds during the winter time, and maybe the summer winds or something during, coming off the oceans during the. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I, I really, like I said, this doesn't. The whole thing doesn't make sense to me. Right. <laughs> but that's what he did. Okay. So 180 degrees every 15 minutes. He was just switching back and forth for 15 minutes for four hours. And the shape on the bottom there is what he got uh, at the end of his experiment. Mm -hmm. And um, perfect hypothesis proven. <laughs> exactly, it's yeah, a fact now. Exactly. Right. Yeah, yeah. And and that's oh, humans. I, I know. And that's the that's the the assumption that this entire stack has been you know built on top of. Yeah. And uh, again, if, if if you just look at that, I mean, it's not a Carolina Bay. It's not elliptical. It's not even close. Like yeah. he, he made actually, he did a really good job making a an oriented lake which yeah. is what he was trying to do and he did a great job he got his doctorates he went on to become a uh you know a successful geologist in the oil and gas industry he never went back to back to carolina base mm -hmm. you, you don't see any other papers written by ray kowsaworski you don't mm -hmm. see any of that 
Um, you know, he had jumped away from this as quickly as possible. Right, right. <laughs> so y'all, y'all, y'all deal with deal with it now. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, again, if we go back to that scientific method, you know, if if you are, you, you know, you state your problem, you do your research. You know, he did all that fine. That was all great. You know, whatever. Um, you form your hypothesis, you know, you have to account for, for variables and that yeah. was absolutely not done here at all. Right. Um, you know, again, you, you have to assume that all of these Carolina Bay started as circular depressions full of water, you mm -hmm. know, they, they would have all had to have been lakes, uh, and they would have had to have been lakes for long enough that that water would swirl, swirl around mm -hmm. and create those elliptical shapes. And then he didn't even make the elliptical shape that we call Carolina Bay's today. Mm -hmm. Um, it, this is what this is what it's all built on, yeah. you know. And again, it's that's lakes full of water. So it starts as a lake full of water, whether it's in South Carolina, North Carolina, Nebraska. Well, uh, the ones in Nebraska and and uh, Kansas, those are new. Those weren't. They didn't even know that they were there. Yeah, they right, didn't know right. that they were there back but, in the seventies. But just for this theory to be true, then you would have had to have just lakes, round, perfectly circular lakes, mm -hmm. seventy thousand of them all over America, filled mm -hmm. with water mm -hmm. and being impacted by wind that's coming off yeah, of an yeah. ice sheet in the exact same way. Yep, for over a hundred thousand years. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. And so you know, uh, like I said, the lack of where, do, where, would, where would the perfectly round lakes have? That's what I, that's come what from? I mean. Like and, and like that, why, like they're all like what like. <laughs> like 10 feet deep basically i guess yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah they're very right. shallow they're and all that, very shallow and that's just a natural geological feature that would just have appeared yeah. from and, nowhere right and we don't yeah. want to talk about it right <laughs> it's just wind yeah it's just wind yeah yeah yeah, yeah. okay got yeah. it move yeah. on move on okay um anyways here's uh here's another just this is another example um, I, like i said michael davis uh, has been putting in a lot of time he actually put out a book a couple years ago uh that just showed these uh he's got a really cool slider tool that you can use with them and kind of go back and forth to show the uh the ellipse, yeah, the uh, the ellipse uh, and the orientation of all these. Uh, it's just another neat way to look at them. And you can see, I mean, just from this picture there, you can. How many can you count? I mean, I, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You know, there's probably a, probably a dozen just in this picture alone. So yeah. that's like two miles long, right there. That yeah, one. yeah, yeah. These some of these are not they're not small. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And, and so how like how how deep are these things again? Um, you know, they're only a couple meters deep. They're not very yeah. deep at all. Now, right. now, as far as like how deep could they have been? I don't know. Okay. Um, you know, um, you can, we try to dig to the bottom of one and I don't know if we got to one or if we were digging into something else, it was really difficult to tell. And are they as deep? Are they like, is it a consistent depth all the way across or is the part that's farther oh, away? That's flat. Yeah. That's super, the, totally the center flat. of those totally flat all wow. the way across. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. And it, and it is hard to tell. Like if you were standing in, in the middle of uh, in the middle of that bay, it would be very difficult to tell where the rim is if you were in there real you know in real time. Yeah, it's hard to tell. Um, some of them they're easier to tell. Um, I've been to a few where it's like absolutely you're on a rim of a Carolina Bay. Yeah. Um, but you can like I said you could drive through the entire state of, of you know North or South Carolina and pass thousands and thousands and thousands of them and right. not even realize it, not right. even know it. Right. Um, so so th and that's why the lighters become so important. Um, there's certain things like hill shading that Michael Davis uses. The color is really important because it really. Mm -hmm pops those things out and you can really see those things. And again, to me, uh, the, the LIDAR itself should have been the game changer. Like that should yeah. have been yeah. where every single geologist on the planet was like, Oh, hold up, hold right. up. Right. Right. But no, they, they, you know, yeah. barrel down and they're like, no wind and water. Right. Shut right. up. Well, move on. David Gress should have been the same thing, but it does take yeah. people a while to, yeah. you know, yeah. to come along to, to really well, get it, to, to understand, mm -hmm. you know, so I, I bet, I bet that this will be, and I bet this conversation will help this, this thing progress so. forward, so. but, but people will get there, but it does take way longer than it well, should. Well, you know, and they have that, that saying that, you know, science advances one funeral at a time. Right. 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 And I really hope that we are in a place now where that's not the case. Like we don't have to wait for someone to die, yeah. you know, to, to advance, you know, yeah. the, the true, the truth of what's happening, you right. know, because it's, 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 it's too in your face. Yeah. And really they, you sh at some point I would, I would feel foolish if I was continuing to push that hypothesis as, as the formation of these, of these features, I would feel foolish. Yeah. And I would, I would be the one that would say, I think I was wrong. Yeah, sure. You know, let's, 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 let's advance. Let's, let's, let's move forward because, you know, obviously it's, it's been long enough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. um, and, and like I said, you know, they didn't even have access to, uh, the Nebraska rainwater basins. Uh, here's a couple images from Nebraska. Uh, and if you click on that, you can obviously, you know, same thing, the yeah. same elliptical shapes, the same, I mean, perfectly flat within those, uh, with those, um, ellipses, but they have that orientation that's going in the completely opposite direction. Uh, and they all kind of, kind of meet, mm -hmm. uh, right along the great lakes, which we'll look at here in just a second. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right here. So, you know, is there a more plausible explanation for Carolina bays? You know, I think that there really could be, um, you know, like I said, if we look at, this is a really good image. I put this together, a little mosaic here. Um, but you know, you can look at those Carolina bays, look at their elliptical shapes. Again, uh, the, the chances of, of that being gradual to me is very, very low. 
Um, you go across to uh, Nebraska and Kansas, you, you see these same exact shapes pointing in the same direction. These are a little more worn. They're a little more eroded. You know, they're, they've been around, uh, but, um, you know, you can still see that they're there. Uh, and again, where they all point to is right in the center of Michigan. I mean, it's, they, they literally all point to Michigan as, you know, like I like to say, it's like a bunch of tattling third graders, you know, like, oh, he did it, he did right, it, you know, right, and right. they're all pointed right to, like, the l most likely probability of, of how these things could have formed. Yeah. Um, and, and so that, you know, that brings us to the, the, I think the most probable cause is that there was an impact into an ice sheet, um, you know, a primary impact into an ice sheet and that the Carolina bays and the Nebraska rainwater basins are secondary effects of that impact. I mean, that's the, to me, that's the only plausible explanation of why these things could be where they are and how we see them. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. I don't, yeah. I don't know how else to say it, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, I will, if you want to go back Ryan, real quick, um, that image on the top there, uh, top left, you know, that is where they all point to. And this is something that I didn't really want to get into at the uh, cosmic summit, because this is something that, that really upsets a whole nother branch of geology. Uh, Michigan geologists have been, you know, digging into that, those rocks for a long, long, long time. Mm -hmm. uh, and to suggest that the Michigan basin, which is that ring shaped bullseye that you see there over Michigan, that's, that's the bedrock geology of Michigan. Um, and that is where all of the Carolina bays and all of the Nebraska rainwater basins cross right over that, that ringed bedrock, that bullseye, that is the state of Michigan. Um, I, I, again, I don't know how many coincidences have to line up before, you know, we start right. to reevaluate a few things, but um, and you know, what, what are the colors? I can't quite. Is that depth or what is that? Those are different rock types. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So this is this is actually a base. And now now obviously it's it's not. It's kind of like the um the uh, the Rishot structure. Uh -huh. uh, except the the Rishot structure is a dome. It's, it was a lava dome underneath that that kind of lifted up, and so you end up with these layers of bedrock that have eroded away. Yeah. And so you can see them, you know, from the surface. It's the same thing with uh, with Michigan, except it's a basin. It's actually sunk in. It's not lifted up like a dome. So it's mm -hmm. sunk in, but you still have. Um, different levels of, of rock. It, now, the uh, another geologic uh, law is um, uh, superposition and uh, original horizontality, and which basically says that you know, like sandstone, for instance, it forms flat. They form flat layers. They turn to stone, and then at some point, you know, it gets lifted or, or becomes a, an anticline or a syncline or something like that, and um, that happens afterwards, right? But that's if you read the geology of Michigan, you know, most most of the geologists say that this formed as a basin and the sand formed these like really neat bowl shaped um, sandstones. And um, and and that's impossible. Like that can't that can't form like that. So so everything had to have been laid flat and horizontal at one time and then pushed down uh, to to create that that basin itself. And then the top got eroded away. You know, there's been multiple ice ages and multiple uh, um uh, advances of ice sheets that have just scoured the top of this thing over and over back again. and forth. Yeah, back and, and forth. so so when you look at the uh, the 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 bedrock geology of Michigan, you you get these ringed shapes of the different types of rock uh, that go back in time. They actually get uh, older as you get to the edges. Okay, so so this would have been obviously under the ice. This 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 would have been under the ice, mm -hmm. and so you'd have had some massive meteor coming down, crashing into the top of the ice. I mean, I, again, that's that's a hypothesis that I would that would help you know put out there. Yeah. That uh, you know where all of those Carolina bays and all of those Nebraska rainwater basins crossed, there was an impact that happened there, right. and there just so happens to be a ring-shaped basin that's right at that location. Yeah. I, I would put that. I would put that into that hypothesis. Yes. But, but walk walk me through that hypothesis though. So what does it look like? It, it's it, I think that there would have had to have been a couple miles of ice on top of Michigan that just okay. got just got nailed. Okay. I think that that something came in from from space and and slammed into Michigan. Um, we'll get into a little bit more later about, uh, some of the other, you know, lines of evidence that might lead to this actually being part of this mm -hmm. uh, hypothesis, but, um, and, and it would have been like a, a secondary effect. If, if you have something coming in from space, hitting that ice, that ice has got to go somewhere. Right. And as it gets launched, it comes back down. And I think that's what created those Carolina bays. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, now again, we'll look at a couple of different hypotheses because this is sure. the only, you know, right. Uh, There's other possibilities, yeah. but, yeah. but, but the possibilities that make the most sense all involve an impact. I think so. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. And it's just kind of a question of what shoots up into the air. Is it ice or is it the ground and how high does it go? And mm -hmm. does it, you know. Yeah. And keep in mind that they haven't found, like I said, there's no meteorites or anything like that found in the Carolina Bays. Um, and, and it's kind of like, you know, the the riddle or whatever that, you know, ice is like the, the perfect murder weapon, you know, because you mm -hmm. don't, if it was created by something like ice, you know, what are you left with? You're left with the with, a, with some water, you know, mm -hmm. a pond, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, again, how do you end up with that circular pond with the uh, Aeolian and Lacustrian hypothesis? Well, this is one way that you can end up with a, with mm -hmm. a pond from ice and water like that. Yeah, yeah that, that picture in the middle there is actually a, a chunk of ice that came off of an airplane. 
um, that that you know came down out of the atmosphere and crashed into the uh, into the into the uh, grounds. And you could see, you know, if you were able to look at that from above, that would be an elliptical shaped depression, you know, just made from falling ice. Somebody um, snapped a picture right when that gla- right when it was hitting the ground from an airplane. I don't know. <laughs> no, that, I think that, that looks like ice that's on the ground all around it. Oh, it's on the ground. Yeah, that's not yeah. flying up in the air. Yeah, yeah, my bad. Yeah, you're right. Um, there's another there's another uh, <laughs> example of it might be the same one. Uh, it was in uh, Scotland or Ireland. Uh, and a lady was outside. She heard this huge crash and went outside and a huge chunk of ice had fallen into her backyard. Uh-huh. Uh, but it formed an ellipse. I made a whole video about it. It's on my YouTube channel. Yeah. Um, so, so whatever hit in Michigan, if it hit in Michigan, mm-hmm. then what, like, where's that? Like, is, why is there no evidence for that? Uh, again, I, you know, if you ask a, a geologist from Michigan, that's, that's, that, that's the dumbest thing they've ever heard. Yeah, <laughs> it is. It is. It's, and they get really upset. And, yeah. and, you know, I've had discussions where, you know, eventually is like, you know, just go away kind of a thing. And I'm like, yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. You know, and, uh, you know, again, I, to me, it looks like that's where all the, the arrows are pointing. Yeah. Um, but you know, and I think there's a lot of, um, geology that needs to be reexamined in that area. Yeah. There's a lot of oil and gas that's going on right there. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of, um, uh, natural gas being extracted and, mm-hmm. and natural gas comes from, well, we fracking for instance is, you know, they actually go and they fracture shale. Well, they don't really have to do that there because the ground's already fractured, mm-hmm. you know? So they're, they're, it's like, well, what, what caused the fracturing of that shale in Michigan to, to, you know, to be able to go down there and get all that natural gas and, uh, again, there's a lot of, a lot of errors that point to this possibility, but yeah. yeah. What about, could it have been an airburst? Have you considered it? It could have been, it could have been. Yeah. You know, we, um, but an airburst over the ice that shot the ice out mm-hmm. in all different directions. Yeah. Yeah. I think that could be a possibility. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more later I'm about, about why I think it did actually make impact. And then, um, if you look at, uh, where Saginaw Bay is, it's kind of the, like the part of the thumb and the finger right here of, of the mitten of Michigan. Uh, that may actually show some directionality of the impactor that, that hit Michigan. Okay. Um, and I think it did hit the ground there. But if you had a couple miles of ice on top of Michigan, I mean, it, it's it's something coming in from space. You know, the reason why it blows up most of the time they blow up in the atmosphere is because they're hitting different le- levels of density. And and that causes, you know, the atmosphere itself is a difference in, in density and pressure. And that causes these things to explode most of the time before they hit the ground. Uh, the second it touched the ice, that would have been it, man. It just yeah. would have, you know, the, right. so the crater itself was more than likely in the in the glacier mm-hmm. uh and I, I do think that we had some compression i think that's what, co- what created that um that michigan basin um and uh yeah this this image right here of uh of tunguska you know this was a bowl light that happened um what in 1908 and uh and um you know this this for sure was something coming in from outer space and it blew up over over siberia and um created this this uh, you very unique geology unless it was Nikolai Tesla experiment. Nah, I've heard that too. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Some people have mentioned that. Yeah. That's an interesting one. Yeah. I heard that it's uh, Wi files has a good episode on uh-huh. that. Uh, it's probably unlikely, but who knows? Yeah. I, well, I don't know how you could have like curved the earth to make it like, hey, I, man. I, yeah. Yeah. But then again, I don't, I don't, I don't follow that much. So. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, what was I going to, so, so do you think that the great lakes were, if this event had never happened, would the great lakes that's, be there? That's a great question. And, um, I, I kind of, uh, again, I'm, I'm really going to be taking off some, some, yeah, do it, do it. Yeah. <laughs> it's limited, limitless, limitless. Right? You got it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that the great lakes could be actually a result of this event. Yeah. You know, I've, uh, uh, we'll get into it a little bit more, but you know, I, if, if this did happen this way, it was a major deal. It was yeah. a big, big deal. And, um, I do think that the erosion that would have occurred after this could have easily have created these great lakes the way that we, I mean, if you look at it, they basically surround Michigan. They, mm-hmm. they surround that, that um michigan basin you know like like a catcher's mitt mm-hmm. <laughs> they're just holding it right there mm-hmm. and uh, uh i i do think that if we get in there and we start looking we're going to start seeing some evidence of that yeah uh, but right. so so let's go ahead and look at some of the different um hypotheses that are that have popped up that i think have some plausibility to them good uh the, the first one here is um antonio zamora he's a he's a very popular youtuber now mm-hmm. um you know and, and i'll point out that uh there, there's two main hypotheses that we'll discuss today uh, and, and neither one of these are coming from mainstream scientists. Uh, and again, I think that's a problem. I think that that should, if anything, these, these guys should be being pushed along and helped and they're really not, mm-hmm. uh, because these are, to me, I think they're, they're actually really plausible, um, hypotheses for, or at least an alternative hypothesis for, uh, how these Carolina Bays formed. Um, again, the first one is, uh, Antonio Zamora. Uh, he is actually a, uh, he was a, a chemist and a computer scientist in his, uh, you know, as his day job. Uh, and he's retired. This is, this is actually what he has chose to use his retirement for, uh, is to to progress the the you know the, the actual probable cause of the Carolina Bays. Um, now his hypothesis uh, he does point to the Younger Trias, uh, which is you know again this is something that has picked up a lot of steam. Um, you know I've I've been on board with the Younger Trias since I first learned about it. I think it's it's absolutely um, a, a possibility and, and likely 
uh, that's Seems pretty obvious. Yeah, that something happened so, yeah. thirteen thousand years ago that that changed everything for us as a species. Like the overhunting things uh, is like the crazy, like mm -hmm. like the, the, the like that humans could have just figured out after three hundred to eight hundred thousand years, however long we've been here, how to not only kill one species. The, the overhunting hypothesis yeah. of, of all of a sudden we can kill, we can annihilate to the point of extinction fifteen different large mammal species while at the same yeah. time going through a bottleneck. And, and, and it was more than that. I think it was. I think the actual figure just like, in North America. Yeah, like, yeah, it's yeah. like seventy percent of like. 72% of the mega mammals over, you know, animals over a hundred pounds, yeah. you know, went extinct. So right. and it's, it's, right. it's, it's insane. It's crazy. And, and that includes us. That includes yeah. humans. You know, if you look at the, uh, and, and I know this, this upsets a lot of archaeologists, um, but there was a definite uh, reduction in the culture of the Clovis people at the time. We call them the Clovis people only because they were all using the same type of manufactured point um, that are found all across North America. I mean, they're found all over the place. Uh, but we've never found, you know, a, a fossilized uh, skeleton or anything like that. There's one like infant that was found somewhere in uh, Montana, I think it was. We found footprints recently. Yeah, recently. Yeah. And those footprints are dating back. They, they've cross-referenced those footprints and they all date back to like over 20,000, was it 22,000 years? Yeah. That's, yeah. that's rewriting history. I mean, 100%. That, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, interestingly enough, you know, and it kind of ties into these Carolina Bays, um, there's a site in South Carolina called Topper. Uh, who they have found evidence, which is actually in a Carolina Bay. Uh, they found evidence that goes back. He, the, um, the scientist is uh, um, Albert Goodyear, and uh, he has you know, proposed that the evidence that he's finding goes back 50,000 years, uh, where there is an occupation site there that you know, has come and gone in the past, but he, he, he's pretty confident that we can actually go back 50,000 years in history. And that's, again, that's unheard of and, mm -hmm. and that automatically gets him shelved into like a fringe yeah, you know, like, oh, yeah, yeah right. don't, don't listen to anything good you're asked to say right, kind of right, right. Uh, but he's a really good archaeologist and he's been putting in a lot of good time and a lot of good work and that's mm -hmm. um you know it's too bad that that that's what yeah right and now we now works. we have this evidence in, in white sands that uh you know absolutely is dating back to over twenty thousand years and yeah. that pushes back our you know human presence in north america over double what we originally thought of you know that clovis verse is done it's right. gone yeah that's dead and uh but you know there's still people out there pushing that and, oh, sure. and they're the same people that are that are like attacking wikipedia and, and staying up all night waiting for somebody to post something different and they take it off mm -hmm. you know those are the same people mm -hmm. it's the same people that are pushing clovis first and uh it's 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 kind of sad really yeah. actually but yeah it is yeah so anyways uh antonio zamora um his hypothesis again younger dryas um and a big part of his hypothesis is that there was an impact into the Laurentide ice sheet at the time, and the the ice chunks would have been launched from the site of the impact. So you would have had huge boulders of frozen ice uh, that would have been launched from the site, reached uh, suborbit where they would have hit the triple point of water, froze solid. You know, if there was any melting, they would have froze solid again, and then came back down uh, in these huge chunks of ice, some the size of like. Uh, you know, uh, was Tropicana Field or whatever here close by, uh, you know, stadium sized chunks of ice coming back down onto onto the earth. And that's what created these Carolina Bays. He also includes viscous relaxation, uh, because if you have these huge chunks of ice coming down, they're causing earthquakes to occur. You have a lot of shaking going on. Uh, and then as soon as they stop, everything gets gets solidified into that, that into that shape. Uh, so that's a big part of his hypothesis is that, you know, they're formed from falling falling ice debris and um, the conic section of their impact is what creates the ellipses. So a conic section is, you know, as, as an impactor goes into whatever substance it's going into, in this case, it's unconsolidated sediment. Um, it, it's getting pushed in, but the cone itself is the shape that it's actually making. And you're left with the ellipse of that cone itself on the ground. Uh, and so that's a big part of his uh, hypothesis. And again, he uses things like, uh, do you have a question about that? Or? Is he is he suggesting that they're falling directly down from, that they've gone up into the atmosphere and that they've frozen and then they're falling straight down? Not or? straight down, no. Okay. That they're, that's, it's directional from from the impact launch and then coming back down. Got it. Okay, yeah. got it. Um, so, and again, that's what gives you that, because if they were coming straight down, you would end up with circular Exactly, yeah, right? yeah. Um, but because they're at, and, and again, you also keep in mind too that they're, it's a lot slower at this point, you know, because if something gets launched into the air, you know, it pretty much almost reaches terminal velocity coming back down, I, I would assume. Mm -hmm. uh, and as it's coming back down, it's going to be a lot slower. Um, I think uh, a lot of people argue against it that, you know, well, impacts form circular craters anyways, but that's coming from, you know, outer space, you know, it's coming mm -hmm. at a much, much faster uh, rates of speed. These still would have been super fast. He's got, he's really good at the, I really like his physics. Uh, yeah. if, you, if you follow or, or follow along. He's a brilliant uh, guy. Yeah, he does a great yeah. job of, of, you know, everything he says, he's got, you know, something to back it up, some some physics to go along with it. Uh, and, I, and I really respect that about the way he, he, uh, 
uh, presents his hypothesis. I, there's some issues I have with it, and we'll talk about that here in a few minutes. Yep. Um, but I, I think this is a pretty strong hypothesis, and again, it's why it's my number one probability. Uh, and then he also uses things like that, that megafauna uh, mass extinction, uh, the, the loss of the Clovis uh, people, you know, and then all of the evidence that we're finding for the Younger Dryas, like the black matte layer, um, you know, the platinum that we're finding, that's a big one. Yeah. Um, you know, we have these, these uh, rare earth metals that are found in cosmic debris that we're finding a, a trace uh, amount of, uh, again, that's being used uh, for the Younger Dryas, and he's tying that into his Carolina Bay hypothesis. Yeah, so. yeah. Yeah, it's awesome. It's great research. It's, I just think it's important for people to realize that it's not necessary for this event to have happened 12,000 years ago um, for the Younger Dryas to be a legitimate real event. Like mm -hmm. the Younger Dryas happened. Like yes. it, it was a time yes. of like extraordinary yeah, catastrophe. Nobody argues about that. Yeah, Nobody's that arguing about that. It definitely happened. as a 1,200 yeah. year period of time right. where we were rocked back into an ice age. 100%. Now, yes. Yeah, yes. yeah. But, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the impact, that this particular impact that formed the Carolina Bays happened at that time. It was. Well, well, it doesn't necessarily mean that, but that's what and that's what Antonio Zamora hypothesizes For, is that it yeah. was this impact that that launched the Younger Dryas and created the Carolina Bays. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. he 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 definitely ties both of those. He, in he does. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, he's not the only one, though, that has a, a probable hypothesis for the formation of the Carolina Bays. You know, uh, another probability comes from Michael Davius, the guy who has been putting out this LIDAR for the past decade. Uh, and again, has just been, you know, putting in tireless amount of uh, energy and, and, and um, uh, effort into the Carolina Bay surveys or the Ovoid Basin surveys. Uh, he also has a research partner, uh, Thomas Harris, Tim Harris. Um, now, both of these guys, like I said, neither one of them are geologists. Neither one of them are archaeologists or anything like that. Um, Michael Davius had a career in computer science, uh, so he's, he's really good at problem solving. He's really good behind the computer, and I think that's that's a helpful uh, you know, both helpful traits to have for, for solving mysteries. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I want them in my mystery machine. Mm -hmm. for sure. Uh, we also have, uh, and again, Thomas Harris is, uh, he's actually an engineer and I'll, I'm going to mention him in just a minute. Cause there's a story I have, uh, that I, I found really interesting. Um, now their hypothesis, uh, is the only thing that they have in common with, with Antonio Zamora's hypothesis is that there was an impact into the Laurentide actually. That's the only similarity. So, yeah. so, yeah. um, you know, the time frame for, for Michael Davis's hypothesis is 786,000 years ago. And that's kind of a very specific date, um, that goes way back. So it's not even close. Like it's not even like, like remotely close to the younger Trias in time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it goes back. I mean, I mean, we're talking like almost a million years now, you know, 800,000 years or so. Um, so that's that's their time frame. We'll, I'll talk a little bit more about why that's their time frame here in just a second. Um, their mechanism, uh, and uh, Michael Davies does not think that uh, these large ice chunks could survive a trip from after an impact like that. So he's he's been out of that from the beginning. Um, he thinks that what created these Carolina Bays, these elliptical shaped depressions, uh, are from a cavitated ejecta regolith blanket, uh, which based yeah yeah that's a big one that's a big one. Uh, but what he thinks happened is that the impact hit the Michigan area. Now, Michigan's made up of sandstones, and he thinks that there was, uh, that impact um, made a matrix of, of um, glacial meltwater and a mix of, of um, Michigan sand that's just been pulverized, and that that would have blasted out or washed over the, the North American landscape. And as they were settling, or as they came back down, uh, a cavitated elliptical shape formed, uh, kind of like when you're painting and you know you put a fresh coat of paint on, you get a bubble and it pops and it leaves like a little a little ellipse. Um, he thinks that that's what created the Carolina Bays was this cavitated regolith blanket that that came away from the uh, the impact. Uh, and there may be some truth to that. Um, he uh, is really interested in uh, some sterile sand layers that we find across North America, where we find just like ten or twelve feet of sand and we don't know where it came from. Uh, there's nothing in it. It's one hundred percent sterile. Uh, there's no you know no critters in there, no fossils, nothing. It's just, it's just sterile sand and. Um, there's there's blankets of that in places around North America, and he's really he's you know he thinks that came from the impact that hit Michigan, and that was the pulverized Michigan sandstone that created those sands. Um, and so there may be some truth to that. I, I don't know. This is it like flinging mud, kind of. I guess so, I, maybe yeah. maybe. Um, I can't quite picture it. I yeah, guess, it's 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 one that I'm a little bit more. Uh, it's difficult to. I'm kind of like an ox, a, a uh, Occam's razor kind of a guy. Like I, I, the, the simplest explanation is probably the most likely. And so once you start mixing in a lot of variables like that, I'm like, mm, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but that is what, again, that's his, his hypothesis. Um, now the, mo the, the notable lines of evidence that he uses, uh, there's, there's some really unique things that happened 786,000 years ago. Uh, one is that uh, we had a sudden shift in obliquity of the earth. Now, uh, the Milankovitch cycles is pretty important, which uh, caused that slowdown in the Earth's rotation that I was talking about last week. That's right. That's right. right. Yeah, it could have, yeah, very well yeah. could, have, and that's serious. Like that really, 
if the impact happened as Davis, uh, you know, hypothesizes, it really would have been a major event and um, it would have been, you know, a dot in the eye of the earth, you know, right, and right. that may cause you to like, oh, yeah. flinch a little yeah. bit. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah. Um, so, yeah, that really, I mean, for something to happen now, now, if you read Wikipedia, uh, you know, they, they think it was more of a gradual change to, of course, uh, of obliquity, but basically uh, right around 786,000 years ago, uh, we were coming in and out of ice ages every 41,000 years. And that's not geologically, that's not really that long. Uh, and so these huge ice sheets that we're used to seeing or used to hypothesizing about weren't around before the mid Pleistocene transition. So 41,000 years, you'd have some ice form and then it would melt an ice form and melt. And it was very regular 41,000 year uh, cycles. But then we have the mid Pleistocene transition, and all of a sudden, instead of it being forty-one thousand year cycles of of ice ages, they're hundred thousand year cycles. So now we have a whole lot longer for ice to build up and to create these huge ice sheets that we see currently in Antarctica uh, and the one that would have been over North America at the time. Um, and so, so it's up, it's one hundred thousand years, and it and it reaches its peak at a hundred thousand years, and then fifty thousand years go by, and it shrinks to its smallest point, and then it's back to its largest at mm -hmm. a, at a hundred thousand. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. I believe so. I believe so. We'd have to look at those those cycles. Uh, you could actually kind of see them. But they've more than doubled, essentially. The, yeah, the yeah, cycle yeah, they're, they're, of the ice retracting and expanding is mm, more than more than doubled. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, and they're, they become much bigger. They become much bigger now. Okay. Yep. Um, which is important for either of these hypotheses, you know, to have a tremendous amount of ice on top of them. So mm -hmm. um, now I think, um, like I said, that one of the one of the things that really kind of changed, or maybe really started to rethink some of this, because because keep in mind that before this, um, you know, I I was one hundred percent on board with Samora. Uh, I, I really thought he had put hit the time and the energy into it. Uh, his hypothesis, his questions were really good. He followed them up. He actually does experiments. You know, he's in his backyard with slingshots and ice, you know, and I've had people, you know, like, oh, you're talking about the, the slingshot ice guy. I'm like, yeah, well, what are you doing? You know, right. you know show me yeah. with the wind and water thing. Yeah. And nobody's doing it. Um, and so uh, you're the fan guy. So, yeah. yeah right. right yeah. And, and again, that hasn't been done since 77. Yeah, so, you right. know, yes, he's in his backyard with slingshots. And that's yeah. that's more experimentation than I've seen for Carolina Bays in decades. Really. Absolutely. Um, and so anyways, he's, he's, been, he's been putting in a lot of time, uh, and, and I really thought he was, he was definitely onto it. Now, one of the things that made me really kind of second guess, at least the timing for, for, uh, Carolina Bays, um, was, uh, a conversation I had with, uh, Thomas Harris, Tim. Um, he actually, he was, he was coming down, uh, to South Carolina. He's from New York. He's from, he's from, I think the Bronx. And, uh, he was coming down, he was bringing his son down. His son was going to jump on a, uh, a, a yacht or a ship or something. And he was going to be a first mate as they, as they sailed it back up to, uh, up to New York. And, uh, he contacted George, George Howard, and he just said, Hey, I'm going to be, it was just right after COVID, uh, had started, everything had shut down. He was kind of worried about it anyways. He wasn't going to stay in hotels or anything. And, uh, he's like, you know, is there anybody down there that, you know, I could talk to about Carolina Bay's. I'm going to be in the area. I'm going to be in the Carolina Bay area. I just want to, I just want to rap about Carolina Bay's. <laughs> And uh, uh, George gave me my number and he called me. My sister was in town. It was around this time of year, actually. It was like around Christmas time, I think. Uh, my sister was in town with her kids. And and um, I, I was like, Carolina Bay's, Tim, Tim, come on, come stay at the house. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I invited him to the house. And uh, and we had, a, we had a really good conversation that night. You know, we had dinner and um, I put him up in my little, I had a pop-up camper at the time. And, uh, you know, he was, he was good to go with all that. But um, in the process, I, you know, I, I found out that not only is he an engineer, but he was actually a, um, he worked for Lockheed Martin as a uh, ballistic missile reentry specialist. And that's kind of a big deal because at this point, you know, not only am I talking to an engineer, but like, now we're talking about like literal rocket scientists, mm -hmm. you know, in, in, in my mm -hmm. backyard, you know, as we're, you know, having a couple of beers and, and, and talking about Carolina Bays. And, um, and, uh, he was telling me that, you know, yes, he has been using his, uh, his ballistic physics, uh, for reentry of missiles on the Australia Asian tektites. Uh, and he links them back to Michigan where we think the original, you know, impact would have happened. And, and I was like, Oh, that's, wow. yeah, that's kind of a big deal that, yeah. uh, that you can use the same physics for, you know, dropping nuclear bombs in places, uh, to these little tiny pieces of, you know, glass, melt glass that we find on the, the opposite side of the earth. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and to me, I was like, okay, this is, this may have a little bit of merit to it. It didn't, it didn't, you know, uh, I didn't switch teams at that point yet. Um, but I was definitely like, you know, there's, there must be some merit to this cause this guy has really put in some thought and effort into it as well. Uh, and, and I'd really just been kind of like, you know, to me, I thought 786,000 years was just way too old. Um, and, um, you know, that's that's kind of where we're at with it now is, you know, we've got these two sides. We've got mm -hmm. two completely different hypotheses. Uh, and it really boils down to, you know, which one which one's going to hold the most water. Mm -hmm. uh, so. 
I don't know. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I think we can uh, talk about the rest of that in episode two. All right. All right. All right. All right. Excellent. <laughs> excellent. Okay. Yep. Yeah, very good. Very good. So, um, yeah, excellent. Great, great job of, uh, you know, teeing, teeing the thing up. And I then, hope. Yeah, for sure. For yeah. sure. No, a ton of good information in there. I think that was a great, great first, uh, great part one. And then, right. yeah, we'll come back for part two and then we'll kind of explore like the, what, essentially the time and some of the geological features and, and the time. At yeah, which we'll it, look at a few things that, uh, that I, I discovered kind of on accident uh, yeah. and it was almost a gut punch to myself. Yeah. You know, it made me really reconsider a few things uh and and has brought me to where i am today with it and uh we'll, we'll talk about that yeah. during that episode so. awesome awesome yeah all right. all right let's take a quick break now. all right sounds all good right. good stuff sounds good yeah, yeah good all right job. uh but anyways uh so this is what our current shoreline looks like now it's important to note that this is what it looks like now but you know 125,000 years ago uh or i'm sorry i'm sorry uh, at the younger time of the younger Dryas, that shoreline would have been much farther away. It would have been, you know, I don't know exactly how far away it was, but we know that during the peak of the glacial maximum, uh, the shoreline from this location was a hundred miles farther away, like literally a hundred miles. You get in a car and you drive a hundred miles out into the ocean, out into the ocean yeah. and then drop down three or 400 feet. Mm -hmm. That's where the shoreline was during the peak of our last ice age or around 20,000 years ago. That's where the shoreline would have been. And probably around 12-ish 12, 12 thousand years well, ago. Well, so we were coming out of the Ice Age, mm -hmm. and so sea levels would have been slowly rising, mm -hmm. slowly rising. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that gradual, you know, uniformitarianism. Yep. We get that 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 slowly rising, slowly rising. I will say that um, off the coast of Sapelo Island, there is a known Clovis site. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called uh, Gray's Reef. Um, it's a protected wildlife location now, um, uh, marine wildlife uh, location. And uh, but the reason why the reef is there is because there's a hard bottom. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a limestone and a church deposit that's there. And there is signs of the Clovis people taking church, you know, from that site, you know, and, and working stone tools from it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, again, so that puts at least the shoreline at least uh, that's 18 miles offshore and it's 70 feet down. Mm -hmm. We know for sure that at the Younger Dryas, like that was that was dry land. And I don't know how I, I can't tell you how much farther it was mm -hmm. at, at that exact time. Uh, but we know that it was a lot farther away than it is today. Right. Uh, and and then we're, we're rocked into the Younger Dryas. And so that that drops us back into Ice Age temperatures for, you know, twelve hundred uh, yeah, 1200 years. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then it slowly starts rising back up. And, um, and, and you know, we haven't reached our current shoreline levels, um, you know, until about 6,000 years ago. You know, 6,000 years ago, sea levels finally rose to a point where they've been pretty steady. And uh, that's pretty anomalous to me. I think it's kind of uh, amazing that our sea levels have stayed really stable for like 6,000 years. Mm -hmm. But we find archaeological sites all up and down the coast today. We can go and we can find, um, you know, the, the Native Americans that live there and had villages and things like that all up and down the coast um, and uh, so, so now the reason why that's important, uh, we can actually use, now we can use the, um, the uh, Greenland and Antarctica ice core data to match up shorelines of the past with uh, marine oxygen isotope stages. So, so basically what they've done is they've taken these ice cores and they're able to go through, they're able to pull out, you know, pockets of air and test them for um, marine oxygen isotopes. And, and they, they are using those to date back in time. And uh, we actually end up with these MIS stages, which is what that graph is on the side. Um, we are currently at MIS one, and if you if you're looking at that graph, um, the the top, one on top, top right, yep, top yep. right, mm -hmm. uh, where it says number one, that's where we are currently today. Okay, and if you drop down, that's twenty thousand years, so it goes. I mean, almost straight down. You you can't even really hardly see the Younger Dryas on this map, but or on that graph. Uh, but if you drop down, that's the peak of our last glacial maximum, and that's around twenty twenty five thousand years ago. Uh, and we're, again, we're going back in time and we can see that we were going into an ice age for quite a while, but the last time that sea levels were anywhere close to where they are today was at MIS 5E and that's 125,000 years ago. And in, in fact, sea levels were higher than they are today at that point. It's also called the Eemian, uh, time frame. And so at, five, at MIS 5E, sea levels were around nine meters or roughly 30 feet higher than they are today. Okay. Um, now, I don't know where we are, you know, at your studio, but I know, you know, where I woke up this morning, I could see the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you can imagine 30 feet of water on top of that. Yeah. That's where we would have been yeah. 125,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. And when the sea levels were there, a shoreline was created. And we can actually go back and find that shoreline. And that's, that's where, um, you know, Sapelo Island, that information came from a, uh, a field trip guide uh, that I got from a, a Valdosta State University um, geology professor uh, that he used to use because, again, and this is before we had all this this um, marine oxygen isotope data, but 
uh, we were using those Paleolithic shorelines, and they can go to the current shoreline and then backtrack to the, the Pleistocene age shorelines. And, um, you know, one of the things I noticed when I pulled up the LIDAR uh, to show Michael Davis was that we were definitely lacking Carolina Bay's anything below, for sure, anything below that 5E, that mm -hmm. last time that, that sea levels rose to where we are today. Mm -hmm. We don't find any Carolina Bay's below that. So anything below 30 feet, I haven't, I mean, th there, uh, there are a few exceptions, and I'll talk about the exceptions here in a little bit. Um, but in most places along the East Coast, anything below 30 feet or 9 meters completely missing Carolina Bay's. And that's where the... You know, the, the actual name of the presentation is Carolina Bay's. Where do they come from? Which we talked about in episode one. Mm -hmm. And and now we're talking about, like, where do they go? You know, if, if these did occur at the Younger Dryas, mm -hmm. you know, 12,890 years ago, whatever mm -hmm. it is, um, we should see them from the the Piedmont, which is where this, the coastal plain starts, all the way to the beach today. Like, wherever the beach is today, that we should find Carolina Bay's all the way to that point. Mm -hmm. And we don't. Mm -hmm. Like, so where do they go? You know, if they happened at the Younger Dryas, where did all of those Carolina Bay's go? Right. Or... Those Carolina Bays were all the way out to the shoreline, but at the time, the shorelines were a lot farther away, and the sea levels have rose, wiped them all clean, mm -hmm. and then have gone away, and now we're left with this location of no Carolina Bays. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and if that's true, then, you know, these Carolina Bays have to be not only older than the Younger Dryas, but they also have to be older than 125,000 years, mm -hmm. and that's a huge problem. That they, that's a huge problem for the current academically accepted hypothesis, because if you recall, you know, they have these time frames of, of activity between 13,000 years and around 100,000 years. Well, the last time sea levels were higher than they are today was 125,000 years ago, and it appears that they have wiped away all those Carolina Bays. So they have to be older than 125,000 years. And again, that's a big deal. Mm -hmm. That's a big deal. Yeah, so 125,000 years ago, sea levels were 30 feet higher, mm -hmm. and and we don't see any Carolina Bays that are that are that other are, than a few exceptions. Other than we'll, yeah. we'll talk about that. Yeah, yeah, and, and other than a few exceptions w between zero and 30 feet mm -hmm. of sea level. So that's there right. are no no Carolina Bays there, yeah. and that's where sea level was 125,000 yes. years ago. Yep. And so you're theorizing that. Well, that, it, that it was a that, that there's a possibility that it was a the, the rise in sea level that, that came in 125,000 years ago wiped away all the evidence of the Carolina Bays yes. that we would have seen from between sea level and 30 feet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, and not only that, but I'll also add that I think that was the second time that that happened, because if we look at that map, if we look at that graph again, mm -hmm. the last time we were coming in and out of ice ages, in and out of ice ages, the last time sea levels were higher than they were then 125,000 years ago happened at MIS-11C, and that is 400,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we'll get it, well, I'll show you some examples here in a minute, but uh, I think that there is evidence that those Carolina Bays, there are some Carolina Bays that are within uh, 30 feet and 42 feet, which is how high the sea levels rose at MIS-11C, which is 400,000 years ago. Sea levels were 42 feet higher than they are than our current shoreline, okay. uh, around 12 meters. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I think there's evidence of really heavy erosion of the bays that are in that band between 30 and 42 feet and some that are completely missing. And, and I, I'll try to explain that as well in, in a second, why I think that we see some that are really heavily eroded, uh, but a lot of those are gone. But I think that area between 30 and the shoreline, or 30 and our current coastline mm -hmm. has been washed over twice by the, by the ocean. I mean, not, not mm -hmm. just like a, a storm surge or not. Something, I mean, I'm talking about the ocean coming up, daily repetitive tides, daily repetitive wave action, completely erasing Carolina bays. And then... An ice age happens, and all that water retreats, mm -hmm. and and glaciers form on top of North America. Uh, you know, and so again, if this happened at the Younger Dryas, we should still see Carolina Bays all the way to the current shoreline, and and we don't. So let's look at a couple examples, Ryan. And so some people might be screaming, "Well, a tsunami could have come in and di di did it." But yeah, I hear that a lot. Yeah, yeah, but but since the but with the the coastline being a hundred miles farther out into the ocean, a mm -hmm. tsunami is not. And it would have to be what I guess the same size tsunami, like a thirty foot tall wave. That uh, no, it would have to be. I mean, at, at the at the peak of the ice age, like I said, we know that the sea levels were like four hundred feet lower than they are today. So I mean, if we just oh right uh, right, so right, if we right, just right, guesstimate, right, let's yeah. say that we were sea levels yeah. were rising. You know, let's say they were 200 feet, yeah. <laughs> you know, or, yeah. you know, 200 feet lower, yeah. you know, then you would, that would require a, a tsunami, for instance, uh, to be over 230 feet yeah. over the entire North, Northern right, hemisphere. Right. You know? that, that traveled for like a hundred miles onto shore. That's the other thing too. Yeah. It's yeah. also a lot farther away. And, and, and just happened to hit that barrier <laughs> of 30 feet. Right. Like, yeah. Know, yeah. Uh, it just happened to wash up onto the shorelines of our last, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. paling on right. the and, and wipe every one of them away. Just yeah. one wave, which right. seems unlikely. It, it's very unlikely. And, and. Uh, you know, that does, it's not supported by um, the geology of the area because we would, yeah. if, if a tsunami were to happen today, we can actually go to the coastlines of 
uh, Madagascar, the coastlines, uh, the, the uh, eastern coast of Africa. You can go to Australia and you can find chevrons from tsunamis that have washed up into a valley and washed back down. And you can actually find evidence of that tsunami happening. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's no evidence of that. Mm -hmm. like, there's no evidence. There's like maybe one paper I've read of a possible uh, tsunami that washed into the Outer Banks or mm -hmm. something like that. And that's, that's you know, um, and it was actually George Howard that brought that up. And it's, it's just, there, there's, there's not a lot of solid evidence to support it. It's just, it's, you know, it was a, a change in water and, um, you know, some, some issues with the ecology in that area. Uh, but it would have been enough to wash away every single Carolina Bay under 30 right, feet across right. the entire uh, So, so the, the fact that the, that the coastline was so far out, so much farther out than it is today, out into the ocean, mm -hmm. that it was, you know, tens and you know, hundred miles or whatever it is, mm -hmm. that protected the Carolina Bays. Right? I'd imagine, yeah. And I'm yeah. sure at that time there were there were barrier islands and things like that, too, that yeah. protected as well. Yeah. And, and that's what we're talking about now is these, these Pleistocene Age barrier islands. Um, and I think that's why we see uh, evidence of possible... Erosion taking place that's older than four hundred thousand years, even which yeah. puts them way back, puts the Carolina Bays way back in time. Yeah, define a, a barrier island real quick. Uh, so a barrier island is uh, it's, it's usually a, a sand island that forms uh, between the ocean and the mainland. Yeah, um, with a lagoon in between. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. kind of. Usually they start off as like a sandbar, and mm -hmm. then you know they they gradually build. But they're always now they're always in constant motion. They're mm -hmm. always moving around, mm -hmm. and we can actually see most of our our uh, barrier islands today have two parts to them. Mm -hmm. They have a Holocene part, which is new. It's happened within the past 12,000 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and they all have a Pleistocene part, which happened a much older, um, you know, and again, I think we see that with what we're looking at with these Carolina Bays, where you see the Pleistocene, why we still see Carolina Bays on the top of some of these sandhills. Mm -hmm. uh, and we don't see them, you know, below those, below those sandhills, yeah. those, those ancient barrier islands. So, so far, the evidence is pointing towards these being much older. I think so. Yeah. I think so. If, if you are going to use this, I, I absolutely think that it does point to an older uh, formation date for the Carolina Bays. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, something I'll, I'll, I was going to bring up later on, but that's, that's important. I mean, that's, you know, the, the Younger Dryas is, is a big deal. I think that there's a lot of, of science that, are, that is supporting the Younger Dryas right now. Yeah. Um, it's not being fully supported because of certain things. And I think the Carolina Bays are one of those reasons why a lot of mainstream geologists don't get on board with the Younger Dryas is they're like, well, there's no way that these Carolina Bays happened uh, 12,000 years ago, 13,000 years ago, um, even though they don't have anything to support it. You know, they don't even, most of them don't even believe that they're created by an impact, you know, event. Yeah. Um, but they'll use, because we keep lumping in Carolina Bays with a Younger Dryas story, mm -hmm. it's like, oh, this is hogwash, right, I'm, right, I'm right, done. Right, right. And and um, so if we remove the Carolina Bays from a Younger Dry story, it only strengthens it. Actually, I think it strengthens both of their stories. Yeah. I think we're looking at two separate events that are you know, equally as important. Right. Um, and they both need to be focused on a lot more. And so by removing them from one story, it strengthens both of their stories, mm -hmm. I think. I mm -hmm. think. Yeah, I would agree with that. <clears throat> so this is, uh, uh, again, I'll, I'll move through this one pretty quickly because this is the, uh, the original picture that I pulled up to show Michael Davies. Uh, and again, I'm using the... Um, uh, a field trip guide that was created by uh, Valdosta State University uh, geology professor. Um, and he would take his students to Sapelo Island. They would, you know, see and investigate how a current shoreline is working. Uh, they would get back on the ferry, go across uh, to the mainland, get on a bus, and then they would drive to um, the spot where it says stop one, uh, Talbot Formation. And they would get out and they would look at that location because that was the shoreline that was created in the past at MIS 5E. Uh, at 125,000 years ago. And that whole area in between there uh, is known as the Pamlico uh, formation. Mm -hmm. And then past that is the Talbot formation. And so you have these, these locations. And again, I don't want to confuse anybody with a lot of these terms, but these are just barrier islands in the past. And so we have like three steps. We have like three stair steps of, of time and shorelines that were formed as we go into the past. Um, so, so current shore, shoreline, we see it out there in blue. The shoreline from 125,000 years ago is the pin in the middle, and the shoreline from 400,000 years ago is the pin on the left. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, let's go ahead and click on the next one and look at the LiDAR. And, and you can see where the Carolina Bays are on the tops of these shorelines. Uh, and again, you also have to keep in mind that most of these, you have barrier islands and you have a mainland. Just like today, we have a barrier island, like uh, Sapelon in this case. Mm -hmm. And then you have the mainland, which would be around Darien, Georgia. Um, and then you have an area that would have been a, uh, a salt marsh estuary during mm -hmm. the Pleistocene. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you have another barrier island and a mainland that would have been 125,000 years ago. And then you back that up even more into a 400,000 year. But the point of this was just to, sh just to show that we have Carolina Bays on the tops of these sand hills, the tops of these, uh, barrier islands. And, um, you can actually see when you look at the LIDAR, you can see what's called transgression and regression events. A transgression event is when, uh, sea levels rise. Transgression, they rise up, they form that shoreline, and the regression event is them going back down, which we also saw in the uh, the ice core data, where you know you have temperatures rise and they go down, they rise and they go down, and 
And uh, we can see the last couple times that they were higher than today. Not not necessarily the last few times that they happened because that length of time between 125,000 years and 400,000 years, there was like four different ice ages. So now, we're, I mean, we're going deep, deep, deep into mm -hmm. history. Mm -hmm. But we're just looking right now at the past couple times that sea levels were higher than today. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and again, that's, that's important because I, we see those transgressions, we see those regressions, and we also see where we find Carolina Bays and where we don't find Carolina Bays. Now, I really think we see this really well along the coast of um, South Carolina around Myrtle Beach. So this is actually a, a map or you know, it's a Google Earth picture of, of North Myrtle Beach. Um, and you see those really well-defined Carolina Bays uh, on the left part of the screen. <clears throat> There's yeah, well, you can actually really see them well when you're without the Carolina, without the uh, lidar. Um, but you see all those there, right on the left, right above the the graph. See what I'm talking about? Yep. I okay. do, yeah. So there's a whole bunch of Carolina bays there that you can really see. Those are actually some of the first ones that they caught with the uh, that 1930 um, image where they were mm -hmm. taking taking pictures. Mm -hmm. um, so those are very well defined Carolina bays. What I really like about this picture is that we actually see locations right along our current shoreline where the coast drops off really quickly mm -hmm. and and we can see Carolina bays that were truncated the last time sea levels rose. Not this time, but the last time they rose. Uh, and so there's like three bays, really heavily eroded, really super heavily eroded bays right along the current coastline. Um, but you see all that whole area in red? Yeah. No Carolina bays at all. None. All that, that whole area would have been a salt estuary 125,000 years ago. Um, and, and sea levels would have rose uh, and, and wiped out all of those Carolina bays. Um, you can see a little spot there in, in, on the right side where it's green, and there's a Carolina bay on that one. Um, if you click to the next image, I've gone ahead and marked. Uh, I wish I had a like a like a graphics team because <laughs> mm -hmm. this is done with like Microsoft Paint. Mm -hmm. uh, but I've gone in and uh, so was this sign by the way? Uh, is yeah. it? That's a great yeah. sign. Yeah, by the way. Yeah. I really like that. Yeah, yeah thanks. Um, but anyways, uh, so yeah, the red the red mark is the, where the the shoreline of 125,000 years ago would have been. And and notice I have it. Uh, you know, from a current shoreline, it's on both sides because that would have been an island 125,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and then that would have been the mainland uh, where the second red line is. Um, and then we have an estuary behind that as well. Uh, mm -hmm. So you, you, you're kind of, if, if you're leaving the beach, you're going up on an old sand hill and then you're dropping down into an old estuary and then you're going back up onto a, a really ancient sand hill and then back down. So that's that's the order of of the, uh, the LIDAR, it's, it's going up and then down, up and then back down, and then you're back down at sea level on the other side. And, um, but the, the point here again is that you see the difference uh, between the red line and the black line. That's the area between 125,000 years and 400,000 years. And you don't see them on the bottom part of the picture, uh, which would be the seaward side of, of, that, of that barrier island. The leeward side, which is the other side, that's the protected side of that would have been a barrier island. And we actually do see quite a few Carolina Bays up there in blue, um, but they're heavily eroded Carolina Bays. Some of the ones that are more to the uh, top of the picture are like really eroded. Uh, but I think that that was a salt marsh and that they helped preserve those Carolina Bays, which is really interesting and really, uh, really good because I think we can actually go and do some further study on those Carolina Bays and do some core samples. And I, I'm almost 100% guaranteed that we would find estuary salt, you know, uh, salt marsh evidence in those Carolina Bays that you wouldn't find in the uh, the bays that are kind of marked in that green and orange color, because that's that's the highest location. So mm -hmm. uh, those bays that are really well defined that you can see without without the um, without the lidar, those are the oldest. Like that area was never covered in seawater. It's been over a million years since they were covered in seawater. Okay, and so they have been pretty much left untouched, not affected by the sea at all. And that's where we find the most well defined Carolina bays. Mm -hmm. The area between. 42 feet and 30 feet, we find a few Carolina Bays. They're usually on the leeward side of, of the, the ancient barrier island, mm -hmm. and most of them are really heavily eroded, mm -hmm. and we don't find any any on the seaward side below 30 feet. Okay. Yep. Yeah, gotcha. Uh, that's good evidence. Now, there are a few exceptions to the rule. Um, there are a few places where we do find some Carolina Bays that are under 30 feet, and of course, you know, this is where a lot of people are like, you know, naysaying, and they're like, oh, look at these Carolina Bays. Mm -hmm. uh, one example is that in the Delmarva Peninsula, um, the Del Delmarva Peninsula uh, has some really well-defined Carolina Bays. You can't really see them uh, without the aid of the LIDAR, but, you know, you click on that and you can see that whole, uh, yeah. Yeah, that whole line of Carolina Bays. And, and you know, um, Michael Davis does a really good job of putting a, um, a scale on, on all of his images. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the dark blue, um, I may have mentioned earlier, but the dark blue is sea level. And as we go up through the different colors, the next time you see dark blue, that's 10 meters. And so it's a repeating color pattern. 
um, which, you know, here at the coast, it helps a little bit. It confuses some people because they think it's, it's you know, you're going up and then back down. Yeah. Uh, it's sometimes, it's, I, I, I promise you, the more you use this, the mm -hmm. more it becomes uh, easier to, to figure out if you're seeing something uh, going down or up. Okay. Uh, but, I'm um, but, still confused. <laughs> <laughs> so so the, the blue on the left and the right, that's sea level. Okay. Okay, so we have, this is actually uh, the Dunmarva Peninsula. So we have the Atlantic Ocean on one side and we have the um, Chesapeake Bay on the other side. Okay. And um, so we're pretty much going from... The Atlantic Ocean. We're going up uh, about ten meters, and then we're going back down to the Chesapeake Bay. Okay, um, that's that's the order of that picture there. Gotcha. But you see that ridge in the middle there. It, it may only be around ten meters right now, but that ridge is full of Carolina bays. Yeah. Uh, and again, that's ten meters. Um, so that area was above. You know, that's above thirty feet, right? Ten meters is what thirty, thirty-three feet, something like that. So so yeah. it's right on the edge there. It's right on the edge. Mm -hmm. um, but we do see a couple areas where there's some Carolina bays in there. Mm -hmm that are below that, that 30 feet mark. Uh, now it's a really important to note that the Delmarva Peninsula has been experiencing for a long time, something called subsidence. It's actually sinking. Uh, and, and that's why I think we find some Carolina bays that are lower than 30 feet. Again, if, if, if we're gonna say that that's the rule, then this is an exception to the rule. And the reason why there's an exception to the rule is because the ground's sinking. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's well known, it's well documented that the, uh, the Delmarva Peninsula is slowly subsiding. It's kind of like, um, kind of like, uh, uh, New Orleans, like we know for sure, New Orleans is subsiding, it's sinking, mm -hmm. and we're not adding anything to it, so it just keeps getting lower and lower. Now we got this like soup bowl there in, in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. uh, the same thing is happening in the Dump Marva Peninsula, where it's slowly lowering uh, in elevation. Um, the uh, New Jersey area is doing the same thing, like around Cape May, that whole area is kind of sinking a little bit. Uh, now that could be isostatic rebound from ice ages coming in and out. I really don't know. I, all I know is that it's well documented that it is sinking. Okay. Uh, so that's one exception to the rule. Another exception to the rules, we do find some areas where we don't see Carolina bays where we should see them if this is the rule that, you know, anything above 30 feet, we should find, you know, Carolina bays, uh, really anything above 42 feet, we should see lots of Carolina bays. Um, and in this area, most of this area right here, uh, this is around Charleston, South Carolina. Um, and, you know, again, you don't see any Carolina bays when you when you look at it that way. But when you click on the LIDAR, there are some locations where we find Carolina bays. Um, they're also on top of ancient barrier islands. Um, but this whole area, a lot of this area is above 30 feet. It's, it's, it's way up there. Um, but we see a, a lot of evidence of transgression and regression events. And again, if this is an exception to the rule, um, this whole area has been experiencing tectonic uplift. And there's, there's actually quite a bit of um, tectonic activity still happening around Charleston. They have earthquakes and things like that all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's because the whole area is slowly lifting. Uh, and so it lifts areas that were affected by the transgression and regression events of the past shoreline, you know, the, the, the 125,000 years ago and 400,000 years ago event, um, that's all documented in this image, but it's, it's been pushed up. And so that's why we don't find Carolina Bays there, in my opinion. Um, but those are like two of the big main exceptions on, on, you know, where we should see Carolina Bays and we don't. Um, this area is too high. The other area was too low. Um, but most everything else along the East Coast, you're going to find that, you know, right around 30 feet, you know, no Carolina Bays all the way to the coastline. And again, if this was a Younger Dryas event, we shouldn't, they, they should be all the way there. This whole area should be covered in Carolina Bays. Mm -hmm. You know, especially like this picture, like this whole area is high and dry and it's been that way, you know, since, since, since the, the late Pleistocene. So um, we should find Carolina Bays dotting this whole entire shoreline all the way to the Atlantic Ocean. And we don't, we don't see them. So where do they go? Mm -hmm. that's, that's the question. That's the question, yep. So, anyways, that's where uh, that's where I, okay. that's where power went out on me. Okay, <laughs> and, right. I had, right. and I had to, to film a quick addendum. Um, did you want to ask him anything about that before I? Um, kinda... No, I mean, is there any debate on the like? Are are people using the the rising and the and the falling of the land as like a um, like in in the argument? I mean, is is there any discussion? Is there any debate or discussion about whether or not the land is actually rising or falling? Um, that that's come up quite. A, oh, well, I shouldn't say it come up. It's come up quite a bit. Um, it, it has been mentioned before. Uh, and it's still a mystery in the scientific community as well. Uh, when I was looking for research papers on the Paleolithic shorelines, um, I, I know for sure the uh, the geologist from Valdosta State that I contacted um, had brought up some questions about um, dating of Paleolithic shorelines based on isostatic rebound. Mm -hmm. uh, because if, if there are a couple places along the East Coast where we have double shorelines, like we have a location where shoreline formed, and then there's another one like right after it. And, and so that brings up a question like, well, then when did that one happen? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it has been brought up that those were a result of some 
some shift in isostatic rebound or, or adjustments, and, and all of a sudden, you know, we have a quick rise in sea level. Or in this case, when I, and remember, when I say quick, we're talking about geologic time. So right, right now, things like the subs substance that we're finding in, in the Delmarva Peninsula, that could be quick geologically, you know, then we could end up with multiple shorelines, you know, because it's sinking, mm -hmm. you know, or, or vice versa. If you go to Charleston areas, it's slowly rising, and we'll end up with different shorelines because the shorelines are, are changing differently than everywhere else. Mm -hmm. Um, th obviously there's, there's a lot more room for, for, um, you know, research and, mm -hmm. and that's kind of part of this is, you know, a call for research into Carolina bays and how it can relate to the paleo uh, paleontic shorelines. Um, because there's, you know, there's, there's a lot that we still don't know and a lot that uh, is new, you know, there's just a right. lot of new science. This, this, um, the, uh, the ice core data, you know, it's not fully understood, you know, there's, so there's, there's a lot that's coming out of that, that, that we need to, you know, apply to geologic landforms in, in, you know, North America and how it applies to the Younger Dryas and all these other events. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So your, your best guesstimate then, and based on all your research in terms of when they would have been formed is, would be a range between what year and what year? Okay. So from what I've seen, like I said, I, I, I they have to be older than, in my opinion, they have to be older than 125,000 years. Um, Cause we don't find hardly any evidence of Carolina Bays below that shoreline that formed 125,000 years ago. Um, and like I mentioned, I think there's evidence to suggest that the sea level rise of 400,000 years eroded away some of the bays, but there were some bays that were protected because of where they were in location. Um, and again, they're heavily eroded, but they're still there, so we can actually still see them. So I would think that they had to have been between 400,000 years and and, 100, and a million years. Mm -hmm. uh, because a million years ago, like there's a shoreline even farther past all the rest of the ones that we just looked at. Um, and I can't remember the name of it, it was on that slide, but... Uh, I think it's the Penna Holloway uh, shoreline that was created then. That's a million-year-old shoreline. Mm -hmm. uh, and pretty much every landform that we find on the East Coast is younger than one million years. Mm -hmm. um, and so sometime between 400,000 years and a million years, that lines up really well with Michael Davius and Tim Harris's hypothesis that these could be a mid-Pleistocene transition event. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know, do we talk about like some of the things that they have included for like their reasoning for that hypothesis? Uh, no, I don't, I don't think, think so. so. I think we kind of mm -hmm. glossed over that. Yeah, Ryan, can you go back to um, go back to that slide that had their hypothesis? Go back one more. Yeah, this one here. Um, okay, so yeah, you know, I kind of glossed over this, but you know, their timeline seven hundred eighty six thousand years ago. Um, we, we mentioned the obliquity. I think we kind of we kind of left it at that. Um, and I talked about the AA tectite. So we're talking about a couple things that they are using as evidence to support their hypothesis um, that indicate like a major impact event, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and I don't think we talked about the geomagnetic pole reversal that happened 786,000 years ago. Uh, you know, these are things that are getting brought up a lot right now because we're having some some issue or I want to call them issues, but we're having some fluctuation with our, our magnetic poles. Uh, and we're all kind of worried about a reversal happening now, mm -hmm. um, but it very well could have been that you know something smacked the Earth and caused the polar, to cold, you know, the polar shift at the same time that all these other things did. Um, there was there was a uh, an extinction level event that took place there. It's a lot longer ago than obviously the Younger Dryas, so I think there's a lot of research that needs to be done on that. Um, but we for sure find a, a major major benthic foraminifera mass extinction that occurred. 786,000 years ago, right at the mid Pleistocene transition. And what does that mean? What do we know about that? So, so, um, benthic, uh, benthic foraminiferal, um, or I'm sorry, benthic foraminifera are microscopic bottom dwellers. Right. And these are right, like right. super, super tiny microbes that live in the bottom of the ocean. And for, I can't remember what the percentage, it's like 90% of them went extinct or something like that. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a big deal to yeah. have like microscopic bottom dwelling microbes go extinct. Something major happened at that time that, uh, that could have killed that. And, and again, I, I think that, uh, there's a lot more research that needs to be done because if, if we find that many m microbes uh, dying at the bottom of the ocean, what what died at the surface? You know what mm -hmm. was going on then? Um, I'm sure there's there's some evidence there that, that needs to be di uh, dug through. Um, but yeah, there's just a lot of uh, oh another another big one. I have the, the images there, but um, we also see right around the same time that mid Pleistocene transition, um, there was a split between Homo sapiens and, right. and Neanderthals. Right. Uh, from a common ancestor. And we mentioned, we talked about this last night a little bit, but, uh, you know, when things are good, like they continue to be good, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. uh, we don't see major splits in evolution unless stuff gets bad, mm -hmm. it gets like real bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, I think we talked earlier about, you know, the, um, you know, at the Younger Dryas, having a removal of all these like massive animals that are trying to eat us all the time, you know, may have been what led us to the, uh, you know, where we are today with civilization. Well, the same thing. This could still be a human story. You know, that was one of the things that I was so upset about with uh, when I came across all this evidence was, you know, the Younger Dryas is, it's sexy, man. It's cool. You know, it's, it's it, it had us as, as uh, you know, our ancestors were part of it. But 
Uh, it's the same thing with this. If this goes back 786,000 years ago, it's still a human story. It's still mm -hmm. our story uh, and where our species, the Homo sapiens, split from a common ancestor from Neanderthals, and we went our completely separate evolutionary you know, tracks. But regardless, 786,000 years ago is when that split happened from a common ancestor mm -hmm. and, and branched off into these two, two groups of people. Right. So that timeline is really important. And this may be part of the story. You know, whatever created or caused these things to happen is also what caused the Carolina Bays to form. Uh, and to me, I think that's really cool. So and the Earth you know. to slow down on its rotation. Hey, very, you know, hey, like I like I said, you know, you get dotted in the eye by a big space rock. You yeah. know, it's going to cause you to flinch a little bit, yeah. and yeah. water might get sloshed around. I'm not going to I'm not going to yeah. knock it. Hey. Yeah, <laughs> it's a it's an interesting thought experiment. Yeah. 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 So so anyways, um, let's um scoot back up to where we were. And if a geologist isn't going to knock it, then I mean, you know. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm an educator. Let's just, let's, uh, yeah, you know, yeah, I have yeah. a, a good, solid background in geology. Yeah. Um, but my main goal is education. So when yeah. I came across uh, an issue like the Carolina Bays, again, to me, it was low-hanging fruit. Um, I, I, for a long time, I supported the Younger Dryas hypothesis with the Carolina Bays. Uh, but like I said, when I, when I went back and saw those paleoatlantic shorelines, I mean, it was literally a gut punch, yep. uh, you know, to my soul yeah. where I had to like, like reevaluate a few things. I quit making you, I, I never took anything off of YouTube. Everything is still on YouTube that I ever created, but I did put disclosure, uh, that I've, my mind has been changed. Yeah. And I think that's important too. I think that a lot of people need to be open to changing their mind, right. you know, and, 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 uh, you know, especially a lot of these guys that have been writing papers for decades, you know, if something comes along, uh, you know, especially something like this, you know, change your mind, you know, they, yeah. they've got to change their minds. Like I said, even with these two guys, you know, Michael Davies and uh, Antonio Zamora, uh, you know, they're they're hell bent on their their hypotheses mm -hmm. and they don't want to they don't want to budge mm -hmm. either way. Yeah. You if know, people could change their mind, then we wouldn't have to advance one death at a time. We right. could advance much quicker. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, when it comes to the Carolina Bays, you know, George Howard has always called them like the kooky caboose of the Younger Dryas hypothesis because, they keep getting brought up. They keep getting. They were actually part of the original um, 2007 paper on on uh, the Younger Dryas. They included Carolina Bays as evidence for that, um, and it was actually removed uh, by a few of the members of the Comet Research Group because they were like, no, no, no. like uh, Christopher Moore. He's a member of the uh, Comet Research Group, and 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 he's like, these these are wind and water features. They're mm -hmm. not they're not impact features. So they need to be taken out of this uh, Younger Dryas impact hypothesis. Um, and they keep just sticking around. They're, they're that kooky caboose. They just keep hanging around behind the Younger Dryas. Yep. Um, and, and as I mentioned during the uh, Cosmic Summit, you know, it may be about time to like pull that pin of that, that, um, that kooky caboose and just let it, let it be its own thing because I think that it is its own thing. And I think that it's, you know, whatever happened to create or form those Carolina Bays needs to be researched. Uh, and if we keep sticking it with the Younger Dryas, it's not going to get researched. And mm -hmm. It's going to continue to be ignored. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's where I think we are right now. I think what we really need to be doing you know, it's just like anything else. You know, if you have two opinions that are so far apart from each other, um, you know, the truth is going to be somewhere in the middle. Right. Absolutely. So so you've yeah. got you've got Michael Davis's ideas, Michael Davis and Tim Harris. You've got Antonio Zamora. And again, as far as I'm concerned, those are like the number two, you know, one and two probabilities. You know, they're the only ones that are researching this. You know, there's there's no there's nobody in a, in a university somewhere. No grad students are picking up on this, uh, which absolutely they should be. Mm -hmm. um, and and they're, you know. The, the truth is probably going to be somewhere in the middle. And I, and I would suggest that they, you know, we, we use Michael Davies's timeline because I think the evidence supports that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that uh, there's some there's evidence, good evidence to support uh, Antonio Zamora's how they formed, you know, mm -hmm. that they would have formed from ice debris, um, per, perhaps not solid ice chunks. He's dead set on them being solid ice chunks. Um, I think that this would have been more of a like a a uh, fractured conglomerate of glacial ice. Um, you know, one of the things that Ant uh, Antonio Zamora tends to ignore is that glacier ice is a little bit different than block ice. Um, you know, frozen block ice is, is it fractures and, it, it, you know, it breaks in big chunks. Um, but glacial ice is a little bit different. It's formed from layer after layer after layer of snowfall. Mm -hmm. And it's annual snowfall that, that, that falls, it gets compressed, uh, and it forms something called fern, uh, F-R-N, fern. And, um, the fern is different. It's, it's, it's flexible. It bends. It, it you know, it, it uh, conforms to to the shape of, of the valley it's in or whatever it happens to be. Uh, and, you know, if there was an impact into a huge ice sheet made of this, you know, compacted snowfall, you know, annually, year after year after year. Um, I, first of all, I think it would be uh, really good at absorbing that impact. Uh, and the second, you know, the ejecta from it wouldn't have been completely sought. It would have been extremely highly fractured. Uh, it still would have held together because of the properties of water, you know, cohesion and adhesion and things like that. It would have launched into, into suborbit where the outer part of it would have frozen solid, like Zamora suggests. Mm -hmm. um, but the internal part would have just been completely fractured from that impact. And when these, these solid objects made uh, impact onto the land, the energy gets dispensed really quickly, forming that shallow depression. 
and that elliptical shape. Uh, and you still have that, that um, cone of, of depression, but the energy is dispensed. So, so it doesn't go like 100 feet into the ground. It's pretty much 10 feet in the ground, and you end up with this flat circular depression. Yeah. Uh, that's, very, the, that's the part I don't understand. That's, yeah. the, that's the one thing that I don't, is, is, the, is the flatness and how, it's, how, it's, how they're all flat, and there's no depth to them or anything yeah. like that. Yeah. For me, that, that implies that it's, it wasn't a solid object, that it was like a liquid, that, that, the, that some meteor hit the ice, right. and the ice melted, and it, it sprayed out these massive conglomerates of water. And right. just, right. you know, like, I, I don't know, like, how, how would ice or any type of a rock not leave indentations? How would it leave it all flat? Yeah, well, and again, part of his hypothesis is that these came down, the, the ground was liquefied. You know, the, the shock wave of the impacts themselves caused liquefaction to happen. Liquefaction is when like an earthquake occurs in the sand and the water mix uh, and it basically turns into quicksand. And uh, so as these things were making impact, they were falling pretty much into quicksand. And then it, then it locks once all the falling or all the collisions mm -hmm. stop. There's a lot to it. You know, the thing about the uh, the main academic hypothesis with wind and water and mm -hmm. you know, blowing wind around with fans and things like that. Um, you know, that has never been recreated. You mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. uh, Antonio Zamora has done a really good job of, like I mentioned earlier, using a slingshot with ice in his backyard. He's got some, some uh, 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 a substrate that would be very similar to what we find on the East Coast. Uh, and he does form elliptical shapes, but they're more like what you, what you suggested, that, you know, there's kind of blobby, there's, there's different mm -hmm. shapes and things like that. But at the end, if there was viscous relaxation, you would end up with an elliptical shape. Um, but, you know, I can go to the beach today. You and I can go to the beach right now, and we can kick water with our feet onto the sand mm -hmm. And create Carolina Bay. So right. I've got that image right there. Right. That I mean, <laughs> and and for there to be no residue from. I mean, if, if it's ice, there's no residue. But if it's like rock, you know, or, or whatever, then then mm -hmm. we would find the same thing in Nebraska that we would find in South Carolina. Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. I don't. I don't yeah. Know. But yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Those right. are Carolina Bays. I mean, those right. are miniature Carolina Bays. They're elliptical. They have raised rims, mm -hmm. and they all have orientation to exactly where I kick that water mm -hmm. out of out of the uh, out of the ocean. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. in in two seconds, you know, I can make better Carolina Bays than <laughs> current academic scientists can, you, you know, use with, with fans and, right. and table, you know, sand tables and things like that. Um, you know, so, I mean, that's where I'm with it, man. That's yeah. Just, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you're right. You know, I, I don't know if, if it's a solid ice thing. It could be a property of water that we don't understand. We've never, we've never been able to, you know, see an impact into an ice sheet before and study it. And, and, you know, yeah. and hopefully we don't ever have to see that, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. but, um, but there's a lot of research that needs to be done in this field and, uh, you know, just glacial impacts in general. You know, yeah. we have a huge chunk of ice in South America or in uh, the Southern Hemisphere that, that, you know, we can do some studies on. Um, you know, I don't think we I don't propose we hit it with a big piece of space <laughs> junk. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, we could do some experimentation on, on that because that's exactly what the type of ice was, you know, in North America. Mm -hmm. uh, whenever this happened, again, I think the, the evidence suggests that this could have been a mid-Pleistocene age event. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that it was the, the ejecta of, of that, whether it be uh, water. I do think that there's maybe been some sand involved. Like I said, I, I think that Saginaw Bay, that indention of Saginaw Bay, there's a, definitely a missing chunk of sandstone there. Um, and then we just have seven or eight ice ages that go by and, and wear that whole place down. And, and uh, it makes it really difficult to determine that that was the remnants of a crater, like an ice mm -hmm. sheet crater. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, if I had to... If I had to write it in a story, that's how I would do it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, tell me again. So, so why why is this important? Like, why why what 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 can we learn from understanding how this happened and when it happened? Well, I mean, the bottom line is we have to talk about it. You know, like I said, uh, you know, they're not even mentioned. Like, they are not even part of a Carolina Bay. And the Carolina Bays are not even part of a a geologic setting at all. Like, yeah. they're not in any of. I went through every single science book that I have in in my presence. Like, I have all these books. Uh, and went to the glossary. Carolina Bay isn't mentioned even one time. There's no mention of it in the index. Mm -hmm. um, college books, not even mentioned. Um, you know, they're just not even part of. And, and they're, they're such a dominant feature on, on, the, uh, on, the, on the, the, the coastal plain and, and uh, in Nebraska and in those, uh, those, those prairies over there. And, and they're just not even mentioned. It's not yeah. even. And, and, and again, next to like the rivers themselves, it's like the most dominant feature mm -hmm. and they're just completely ignored. If again, if they're brought up, eh, it's just wind and water, nothing mm -hmm. to worry about there. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it's a sand dune. It's like, well, <laughs> a little more to it than that. And, uh, again, I think, you know, really, I hope if anything, um, having discussions with you like this, uh, you know, bring up those questions and, uh, get them included, just get them included in the, in the discussions. Um, I think I mentioned to you guys, uh, last night that, uh, you know, I, if a group of grad students grabbed hold of this tomorrow and ran with it, more power to them. I'm not going to, I mean, I would get right back to fishing on the weekends right. and, and not, you yeah. know, not, not worrying about the Carolina Bays. I like, you guys solve it. If they came out tomorrow, we're like, you know what? 
Carolina Bays are an impact feature, secondary impacts of an event, of an Ice Age event. I'd be like, thank you. Yeah, right. <laughs> Moving right. We're on. We're done. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Moving on. Matter of fact, Next. that's, you know, my YouTube channel is called The Dabbler's Den mm -hmm. uh, because that's that's what I am. I'm a dabbler. I mean, I go from topic to topic to topic, and I'm way overdue with Carolina Bays right now. Man, I've been in this for way too long. So. <laughs> yeah, ready to figure out the next mystery. Yeah, I need a new yeah. I need a new dabble to get into. Yeah, yeah. So this has been a long one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I think you've pretty much nailed this one. I hope so. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. I mean, but. you know, there's only so many possibilities, and it seems like you've explored all the possibilities. Mm -hmm. and, I, I, yeah. And, yeah. And, and and I, you know, I can agree with you, but. I'm sure there are things that we haven't even thought of that are part of this for part sure. of the story. And for sure. Unless we get, you know, uh, young scientists to take to grab a hold of this and, yeah. and to to push it forward and, you know, make those changes, pull pull that bottom stack of papers out of the uh, stack of assumptions yeah. and, and dust them off and be like, what were you guys thinking back right. in the 70s? Right. This is, right. Look at all the stuff that we have now. We absolutely need to be reevaluating the science of these land features because they are super, super dominant. So, yeah. um, matter of fact, you know, this this was a Cosmic Summit 23 presentation. Uh, I do plan on speaking at the Cosmic, uh, Cosmic Summit 24, so I look cool. forward to seeing you there. Yep, I think you I'll guys be there. Yeah, there. Yeah. Um, and, and the topic of, of my presentation this year uh, is going to be focusing on the pseudo-Carolina Bays. That term pseudo gets tossed around a lot these days. It does, yeah. it's, it's a buzzword in, in archaeology and geology. Mm -hmm. um, but I think these Carolina Bays, these are abs they absolutely should be the norm. Like They should be the feature that all the other, you know, uh, elliptical shaped depressions or the the uh the ones that often get brought up as as co being compared to the carolina bays i think that you know they they all need to be answering to the carolina bays i mean mm -hmm. they they're so perfectly shaped they're so oriented um you know all the rest are pseudo you know mm -hmm. the the thermocarst lakes the the um the playas all that those are the pseudo carolina bays and so i'm going to focus on on those and show how they are not carolina bays yeah Nice. Uh, and so that'll be fun. Love it. Yeah. Love it. Yeah, looking yeah. forward to that. When is that? June or something? It'll be, uh, I'm not exactly sure of the date. I think it's June 15th and okay. 16th. Right. Um, right. It's going to be in Greensboro, uh, North Carolina. Yep. Uh, and then right now we have a fantastic uh, uh, list of, of speakers. It, he, like I said, last year was a proof of concept and it turned out fantastic. Yep. It, it was, I really, I'm sad that you guys weren't there because it was, it was really, really, really a good, uh, a good presentation uh, from everybody. You know, I mentioned that, you know, I felt my biggest complaint of the Cosmic Summit 23 was that it was so great I'd never want to leave. Like I was, I was in a seat and watching them the whole day long. Mm -hmm. uh, and and this year they're going to double it, man. They're going to have twice as many speakers. It's going to be it's going to nice. be outstanding. Yeah, I'm really nice. looking forward to it. So Excellent. yeah, yeah. So here's our we got a current list of uh, speakers right now, and, and we're adding a few more people to this too. Um, you know, guys like you know, obviously Randall Carlson, man. He he grabbed hold of it last year. He spoke for six hours. Wow. He yeah. Uh, he just kept going and going and going. Johanna James, she's she's been fantastic. Uh, yep. Scott will be back on there. Obviously Ben. Um, and, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, we got, uh, Mike Hanks will be there again. Luke, Luke is just blowing it up right now. He is. Yeah. He's, I'm seeing him everywhere now. Yeah. He just got back from the, uh, Yucatan and yes. been popping out videos. Yeah. It's, yeah. He's, he's something else. He's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Russ Allen, you gotta, you gotta get him on the, uh, Mark, uh, Mark Young, you need to try to get him on too. He, this guy is a front runner right now for the, uh, Younger Dryas Impact Hypothesis. Okay. Um, and, and check out his presentation from the Kazakh Summit 23 because he, he nailed it. All right. Um, so yeah, lots of, uh, lots of really interesting topics and, uh, and it's going to be bigger and better than it was last year. Excellent. Yep. Yeah. I yeah. hope to see a lot, hopefully a lot of guests on there, future guests on that list. Good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Get them all on. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah for sure. Good. <laughs> Good. Awesome, man. What else did we miss? Anything? I think we nailed, I think we hit it all. All um, right. I, I, I can't think of anything else that, uh, that we need to get into. All right. All right. I really appreciate you coming down. Appreciate you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Appreciate your time, your knowledge for everybody. I know that this is like, it's such a, it's, a, it's just a topic that nobody has ever even heard of. And That's the thing. Yeah. yeah. And it's such a dominant feature yeah. and, and absolutely, you know, more people need to know about it and they yep. need to be taught about it. It needs yep. to be in the geology classrooms. Yep. Um, you know, regardless, yeah. regardless, you know, you could show them what your current hypothesis is, but you know, they should be experimenting on it and they should be, you right. Know, can, right. you, can you, can you replicate that? Because yep. that's a big part of the, of the scientific process is replication. And yep. Hasn't been done yet. I can do it in five seconds at the beach, but you know, right. Right. Whatever. Right. right. <laughs> awesome, man. Good to have All you right, down. Man. I really appreciate, appreciate it. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. Yep. yep. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.